Good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting in 2024 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. We are joined today by students and staff from the University of Dundee who will observe our evidence taking on pre-budget scrutiny. I welcome you all to the committee meeting and we look forward to chatting to you after at the meeting. Moving on to today's agenda, the first item is to take evidence from the Scottish Government on managing Scotland's public finances, a strategic approach. I welcome to the meeting the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government, Shona Robeson, MSP. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Scottish Government officials, uh, Janine Barrow, Director of Fiscal Sustainability, Richard McCallum, Director of Public Spending, and Lucille Carroll, Director of Tax. Um, so good morning, uh, everyone, and um, welcome you to the meeting. And I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to join the committee today. This is uh, the first time that I've formally appeared in front of the committee since the summer recess and the UK general election. There have been uh, some significant developments during that time, many of which I updated Parliament on through my statement in early September. The Chancellor's statement at the end of July outlined the results of the Treasury's spending audit, which described a £22 billion shortfall in the UK public finances and indeed set the scene for a difficult UK budget on the 30th of October. The audit also estimated that this year's departmental spending budgets are at least £15 billion lower in real terms compared to to 2021 spending review plans. The SFC's uh, fiscal update on the 27th of August provided an update on the current economic and fiscal context, and my statement to Parliament on the 3rd of September set out the difficult decisions we are taking to achieve uh, financial balance this year. The First Minister and I have taken a, a constructive approach to engaging with the new UK Government and I'm pleased to have seen a marked improvement since the election. The First Minister and I met the Chancellor in Glasgow on the 28th of August and have subsequently engaged with her about our priorities for the UK budget and our willingness to work together to achieve these. Last week, I met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, along with the Finance Ministers for, from Wales and Northern Ireland at a meeting of the Finance Inter Interministerial Standing Committee in Belfast. This was a, an opportunity to discuss with the Chief Secretary the challenges facing devolved budgets and how best to address those challenges. Um, I think uh, it was also an opportunity to, um, to convey uh, some of the issues that were raised in Parliament uh, two weeks ago on Scotland's priorities for the forthcoming UK budget. Uh, the Chief Secretary, I have to say, was receptive to the issues raised, and I'm keen uh, to see the, uh, this constructive engagement continue. Following my recent correspondence with the committee, uh, work has begun in earnest towards the publication on the 4th of December of the Scottish Budget for 25-26. The Budget will be built upon the principles outlined by the First Minister in the Programme for Government, those being eradicating child poverty, building prosperity, improving our public services and protecting the planet. I will continue to work across the Chamber to seek common ground, and I look forward to continuing to engage with you throughout the Budget process. So I look forward to engaging today and indeed to further engagement throughout the coming month. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for <coughs> opening your statement. I think we'll probably have quite a wide-ranging discussion today. Um, as you'll know, we took a, a lot of evidence in, in recent weeks regarding what other people believe the, the approach should be as we, as we move forward. And, of course, we, to do that, we have to look at where we are at the moment. And you've, you've pointed out quite clearly the, the kind of challenges that we face. <coughs> uh, last week, we took evidence from COSLA. And one of the, their concerns is that the Scottish Government's understandable approach to eradicating child poverty um, is perhaps a bit two-dimensional, i.e. focused on, for example, uh, benefits. Um, so they, they've said, for example, that the Scottish Government, having increased benefits by £984 million pounds in the current year um, over um, what the UK would, would have provided, has an actual fact. Um, not necessarily helped all the people in poverty that it should. So I'll just say what they're basically saying. They're saying that the opportunity costs of these decisions 
needs to be considered. So, for example, economic uh, development and employability services, which would help to create jobs and support people facing barriers to the labour market and sustain people in paid works, uh, paid, uh, fairly paid jobs, have obviously taken a knock because there's less uh, money available for employability funding. And what they've said is that, um, that, that this would help reduce well, uh, depends on the welfare system. Um, also, providing more affordable housing to help support people out of poverty, reducing homelessness, improving health and educational outcomes. And they suggested that that £984 million in local government, for example, could have provided 15 to 20,000 additional uh, jobs. And Professor Heald said on this uh, issue, he said um, uh, um, specifically, um, he said that. Uh, it is not progressive, in actual fact, to to um, to actually invest uh, in benefits if indeed it impacts on the services that are going to the poorest people. Now, yesterday I went to a, a project um, in my own constituency with Tom Arthur, which looked at providing employability services for uh, um, parents, and it's provided some 300. Uh, jobs over the last seven years, part-time jobs, uh, around 20 hours a week, getting people in the labour market who have never been in it before or may have had to take years out due to children, having children. And yet these are the kind of pro projects that underpin uh, this government's anti-poverty strategy, which they say are being uh, threatened by the fact that the government is just saying, well, we'll just increase benefits, and that money is no longer <laughs> available for them to provide the services. You know, even if you look at schools, for example, educational psychologists, for example, even campus cops can't be afforded by local government because money is going into another area. We realise the budget is fairly, more, fairly um, limited and, and fixed, and the room for manoeuvre isn't great, but it's about these choices. So that's a kind of long-winded way of saying, saying what I said at the beginning, which is what studies have the government made into the opportunity cost of spending money in an area like local government to support its services rather than, for example, straightforward benefits. Thanks, convener. Um, so let me first of all say that there is a balance to be struck here without a doubt in terms of how you tackle poverty. So the Child Poverty Plan um, has a number of pillars to it. One is about direct support to families, and that would encompass some of the areas that you're talking about, like Scottish Child Payment, for example. But it also talks about services and the services that help um, uh, move people and support people out of poverty. So employability is one. And um, for example, we've seen positive trends in relation to the number of parents accessing support since the publication of Best Start Bright Futures uh, back in 2022. The proportion of parents accessing no one left behind support increased uh, from 26 per cent to I think for about 48 per cent. Um, so so some of those services supporting parents into employment, for example, are absolutely critical. Um, and, uh, though, but, but the pillars of, of tackling poverty um, have to do all of those things. Money into to families' pockets is also important. So if you look at our um, ambitions to, to meet our statutory child poverty targets, interim targets, the approach taken by the plan is, is really three-pronged, with the support to people directly, the services that wrap around, so things like childcare, and then the, the um, employability, because we know that work is one of the main ways out of poverty. So it's not, in my view, an either-or. We have to make sure, as the Child Poverty Plan recognises, that, that supports are provided in all of of those uh, ways. I have to say, though, in my own experience going around my constituency, um, I am told time and time again by families who are in the position of um, facing real, real hardship that having money in their pockets is literally putting food on the table. So um, I, I would want to, to push back against any idea that um, you know, that we should somehow diminish the support, particularly the Scottish Child Payment. But we need to make sure, uh, just to anticipate your, uh, we need to make sure that those other services that support 
families um, are also sustained. Now, that means difficult choices potentially in other areas. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone doubts that having more money in your pocket is a, 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 a good way of um, reducing poverty. And obviously, um, but, but I think what, what local government and others are saying is if the money went into their services, they'd be able to provide job, more jobs apart from anything else, which is a be the best way out of poverty. And what Professor Hield said is being progressive on social security and other cash benefits, the expense of public services expenditure have an anti-progressive effect because lower income groups have less access to substitute services if, if uh, satisfactory public services are not available. And I think the concern is that local government is having to focus on its statutory obligations and therefore can't support things like employability services the way they wish. And so put people are trapped on benefits. They may have more benefits than they would otherwise have, but they're still trapped in that area, and, and so it's about trying to break that cycle, I think, in poverty, of poverty, uh, uh, which, I mean, you, you know yourself, the situation yeah. in Dundee is particularly, uh, a particularly uh, difficult one. I mean, I, I absolutely accept that you know, there are services that are critical to tackling poverty, and you know, I accept also that um, in constrained financial times, uh, all services and all layers of government are having to make difficult choices. I would, however, um, you know, point to the, what the, um, the um, Accounts Commission and indeed SPICE themselves have said about the relative position of local government, despite the challenges, that they have seen a real terms increase in funding and an increasing proportion of the funding that the Scottish Government has, has gone to local government. So local government has always asked for an increasing share. It went up by 1% um, in this last uh, budget. Um, is there more that's to be done? Yes, there is. And I think one of the opportunities for local government and for some of the, and for the, particularly for the services like employability is through the spending review that um, I'm sure we'll touch on today that the um, UK government is leading in, that will report in the spring for both resource and capital, that we can get back to multi-year envelopes for services. So for employability, for example, that's really important because it funds a lot of third sector organisations that provide those supports to parents. But having it on one year funding means that they struggle to retain staff. So moving to a multi-year scenario for these services, I think, will help local government per se, but I think will also help with these discrete areas of service. Yeah, I think I completely agree with that. Multi-year funding is something definitely would make a, a significant improvement. Another issue I think the local government would ask for is flexibility. So, for example, the government also has a fairly rigid policy in terms of teacher numbers, although one or two local authorities are kind of railing against that. I mean, my own local authority, for example, has got 12.7 pupils uh, per teacher compared to 13.2, the Scottish average, but it's 18 the average in England. And the issue that, that, is that outcomes haven't really improved um, relative to the amount of money that's going into that, that service. And well, by, by having to maintain high levels of teacher numbers, other services that support that child psychology, for example, um, classroom assistance are having to be reduced. Mm. So would it not be better, and this is what Cosla said, and you'll know this obviously you haven't spoken to him yourself, would it not be better to uh, um, allow greater, I know the teacher, teaching unions might not be too happy as they're looking for even more teachers despite their falling pupil numbers, but it would not be better give local authority, if you give local authorities more flexibility in how they spend the resources they have, it would produce better outcomes. So, um, so look, I recognise these issues are raised with me uh, um, frequently, um, as you uh, are aware. Um, what I would say is that there was close to a billion pounds of resources baselined for local government in 2024-25. So these were areas that were previously ring-fenced, and we, through negotiation, essentially have um, baselined those resources. Now, that was in advance of the agreement around the accountability framework and the fiscal framework, which are, you know, work is, is at an advanced stage. So there was a bit of a risk for the Scottish Government there in de-ring fencing and baselining without the accountability framework around that. But it was, I guess, what you might describe as a goodwill gesture um, while recognising that there are areas that remain um, to be 
discussed. So the point about teacher numbers, um, there are mitigations for uh, areas um, where uh, they, are, they are seeing uh, falling roles or there are other issues around recruitment challenges and so on and so forth that can uh, mitigate uh, against the 145 million allocation. Um, but I guess, you know, bluntly, um, you know, if we're, we want to close the poverty-related attainment gap, um, can we do that with fewer teachers? I think teachers have a, an important role to play, not the only role. And, you know, getting kids to school in the morning, the wraparound services are all important as well. But teachers are also uh, core to that. So we need to get the right balance. We need to have the teachers in the right place. Um, and there are issues with, with that, as you've highlighted yourself, around falling rules in some areas, increasing rules in others. Um, and those discussions are ongoing. We, we want to see a solution that um, is a compromise that we can all live with. But ultimately, what's important is, um, is, the, is closing the poverty-related attainment gap. And teachers are, are an important part of that. Indeed, I mean, so so is the curriculum and how it's taught, and I think there's a whole debate to be had on that mm -hmm. separately. But I, I I understand the government's position on flexibility because you know everyone calls for flexibility when we did the historic concordat in 2007. Local government often did things that the Scottish government weren't happy about, and the Scottish government was getting blamed for decisions that were actually being taken at local authority it's level by this. other political parties. Um, who's, who are running these local authorities. So I understand that, that there's some politics in there, but I just think the flexibility issue is one I think that's not, it's not going to go away. And I, I would hope that the Verity House Agreement will enable greater flexibility to enable better uh, service provision with the resources mm -hmm. that actually we have. I mean, other area, there are other areas where the Scottish Government can make savings, for example. I think, uh, so for example, one of the things that I've, never been, I've always been surprised about is things that like... Uh, you can go and see your GP and get paracetamol. I mean, so I asked a question about that, and for example, the cost of paracetamol prescribed in Scotland was in 2022-23 was nearly 12 million pounds, and it's 56 pounds apparently the cost on average to see a see a doctor. There's other products like Calpol and and ibuprofen have been prescribed. Surely we could save tens of millions of pounds from the medicines budget if things that are readily available in local pharmacies and indeed supermarkets were not no longer on the prescribable list. So, you know, these these are debates that we need to have. I guess I would make two points about it and having, you know, uh, sat through the early years of this debate right through to um, prescription charges being uh, abolished. I think there are some complexities. So, um, so for example, someone uh, who requires a prescription of paracetamol in large doses will not get that over the counter. Um, they will need to get that through pr prescription. Now, I'm not saying that's for that's the case in every case, but some people do require um, a regular um, uh, prescription of of pain relief that just wouldn't be able to be obtained over the counter. So if you remove that from the list, and I can see, you know, that it sounds a straightforward thing to do, you know, just remove it from the list. Well, that then has the complexity of those who rely on pain relief in higher doses. How do they get? So as soon as you open up these things, it, it sounds straightforward, but there are always more complexities to these things, as you can imagine. Should we continue to discuss? Yeah. We need to make sure that in every area of government that we're not, there's no closed doors to thinking about how things are done more efficiently and, and effectively. And certainly, I'm, I know my health colleagues are certainly not uh, uh, you know, closed-minded on any of these things, but I think it's just you know, something that sounds straightforward inevitably is, is, never, is never so. I think it's a question of priorities when resources are limited, to be perfectly honest with you. But, I mean, you talked about, you know, looking at these things again. I mean, as the government uh, looked at, uh, when we were in Estonia as a committee just a couple of weeks ago, we heard that the government there um, is looking at zero-based uh, budgeting. Um, is that something that the Scottish government would be looking at, for example? Jimmy Carter famously brought it in the United States, incidentally, we back in the 70s. Well, look, uh, again, I'm open-minded uh, around uh, any ideas that we can take internationally around how we, uh, how we construct our budget. 
Um, I guess what I'm focused on um, through this process is uh, aligning the budget priorities set out in the programme for government with uh, the resources that we have available to us and how we shape a budget that, um, that, that prioritises that in turn requires some discussion about deprioritising, which is always the difficult part, um, and that we ma that we we create um, we also create a budget that that can command support across Parliament. So, you know, I'm more than happy to look at um, ideas, um, but in the here and now, I guess my focus is is particularly on 25-26. I think where there are opportunities to perhaps think a bit differently about the budget is on that multi-year basis. So having a single year budget makes it very difficult to to be, you know, to, to, to create and, and do things very differently because you essentially have that very fixed uh, position uh, and you're not able to deliver reform and change over a number of financial years. Uh, both in the, the resource and capital space, through multi-year budgeting, we can have, I think, a, a, an opportunity to look at how we do things differently on pay, for example, and on other areas um, that we can take a line of sight um, around the priorities that we have and are able to deliver that on a multi-year budget rather than a single year. I think one of the issues is to widen the tax base and to try and ensure that the Scottish Government does have more resources. Uh, I think that would be important, really, um, for whatever we're doing. I want to just talk about an initiative which has been very successful um, that the Scottish Government introduced, which is a data-driven initiative. So that actually um, was signed in 2018 as part of a, uh, the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City deal uh, d um, and delivered by the uh, University of Edinburgh and Heriot Watt University, which I actually visited last week. And it set a goal of supporting more than 400 entrepreneurs to raise 50 million within 10 years. That has been resoundingly successful. In six years, not 10, they've raised, um, they've managed to lever in more than 200 million pounds of investment rather than the 50 million target. And instead of 400, they've got 500 cutting edge companies um, raising funds to boost work to drive innovation. Yeah. But I feel that the Scottish Government is not investing enough in more of these type of initiatives. So, for example, the University of Scotland gave evidence to us about how, relative to the rest of the UK, the investment that we are actually spending, for example, in, um, has fallen from 16.2% uh, to 13% uh, in recent years. And they're saying that for every pound you invest in that area, and they've they've actually given us the kind of sources of their research which proves that um, they can provide 12.7 times that uh, um, input into the Scottish economy um, you know and they've said that if Scotland can recover its competitive position back to the 15.4 percent share of UKRI funds uh, that we had a few years ago to so deliver an additional economic impact of at least 640 million to Scotland's economy. So what I'm saying is, I mean, the areas where Scotland is globally competitive, including, you know, Dundee and your own, uh, your own neck of the woods, Dundee University and its life sciences, uh, Heriot Watt, where it's with its robotics, etc., and research in marine and space and myriad other areas, should we not be spending more than a minuscule proportion? of Scottish resources in these areas so that we can have the prosperous, highly skilled mm -hmm. workforce of the future? Um, so I think the example that you've raised um, is, is a good one. And um, the research, development and innovation um, is, of course, uh, one of the five uh, core themes in the, the Data Driven Innovation Initiative deal. And it does get uh, uh, 60, 60 million of Scottish Government funding and uh, I think 290 million of, of UK Government money, money funding. And I think that's a good example of, of where we can align some of the funding, the UK Government and the Scottish Government. I'm quite interested in how, for example, the, the UK um, Infrastructure Bank and SNIB can potentially um, work together around some of these critical investments, as well as core Scottish Government funding, but where we uh, see the investment from um, the, the UK Infrastructure Bank and SNIB 
in some of these um, important uh, uh, areas of growth, I think um, there is uh, scope to do to do more. We have um, the development of the Edinburgh Innovation Hub, um, and we have um, the, the investment in business infrastructure, for example, in the Fife uh, in Industrial Innovation Investment Programme, <coughs> Borders Innovation Park, um, and of course the five data-driven innovation hubs that you referred to earlier. So um, we are investing strategically. Um, is there more that we can do? I think that's a legitimate question, and you know we will reflect upon that and the. The bilaterals I'll have with my CABSEC colleagues, I would expect some of these issues to emerge about the importance of, um, of investing in research, but doing that in a strategic way where those uh, growth areas are in Scotland and trying to align some of the funding alongside some of those UK funds, which of course are more extensive than ours, and trying to lever in some of those funds into Scotland is going to be important. So I recognise the point you make about you know, the, the, the growth, the, the value added, and um, we, we need to make sure that we are um, strategically investing in those areas that are going to get the, the best return. Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's, what's of concern to your research universities is basically that you've got the golden triangle of London, Oxford and Cambridge, which sucks in a lot of venture capital, mm -hmm. etc. You know, that's why I raised in the Chamber this year's look proof of concept money, mm -hmm. which they said £5 million pounds of government money, Scottish government money, would bring in some £200 million of private investment. Um, and what we've seen is that some of these um, predictions, for example, in the Data Driven Initiative, have actually been underestimates of how much we can bring in. So... Uh, we're, we're falling behind the rest of the UK is the main issue of making, and yet we've got a potential to, to, make, to take Scotland really forward. And of course, you know, if we're providing employment in these, these high tech areas, it provides tax revenue for the Scottish Government to invest in anti poverty and other initiatives. So I think it's a, mm -hmm. a win win all around. It's just about more, where you invest limited resources, I suppose, to get the best return, which is why I'm mm. really uh, asking about it. I mean, I'm going and to I'll certainly colleagues... reflect on the points you've made yeah, as part yeah. of the budget process. Well, yeah. th th thank you very, very much for that. It's very helpful. Just one other issue, because the colleagues are, are keen to jump, jump in. There's loads of other stuff I could ask, but I'm just going to ask, ask, ask one other question, um, which is um, about progressive taxation. Mm. I mean, one of the issues we have in Scotland, I mean, the UK, UK is, is not, doesn't have progressive taxation. It's got a steps and stairs approach to taxation. But Scotland, we obviously... Uh, are latched onto that because we have limited room to manoeuvre. Um, and we've mentioned this, I think, every year I've raised it, and other colleagues have as well, as the issue of the fact that the marginal rates of tax in Scotland, for example, are just over £50,000 a year or higher than they are at forty. Sorry, they're higher at £43,000 a year because of higher national insurance, which we don't control in Scotland, than they are at 50 odd thousand. So it's basically looking to see what work the Scottish Government is doing to try given the difficulties of that system, um, is looking at whether there's an intention to make it progressive, i.e. as income rises, the, your, your tax, uh, the share of that income that you pay in tax rises, whereas that's not the situation at the moment. You can actually pay less tax, as I've said, earning 55000 a year than 45000 a year. So I'm just wondering what, mm. what, what the Scottish Government is, is doing about that. And on the back of that, what further research has been done about behavioural, uh, about behaviours, um, because the behavioural response to taxation mm -hmm. was trailed very much last year, and of course, uh, there's big debates about um, the impact of increasing taxation. Not so much people fleeing Scotland, which is a kind of misnomer, but people choosing to work less or incorporating or looking at other ways of avoiding paying income tax. So, look, um, you know, I think, as I've said a number of times. Uh, here, um, you know, we are you know, very cognizant of the issue of marginal rates of tax. In some ways, you know, our, our system is um, a bit clunky because it's a hybrid system, um, you know, of um, reserved and devolved taxes. Um, that is a complexity, uh, without a doubt. Um, and we um, continue to monitor, not just internally, but we obviously have. Uh, quite a, a, a great deal of external uh, scrutiny um, through, well, the work of Scottish Fiscal Commission for one, but also the, f the funding uh, that we've um, given to HMRC to monitor 
uh, some of those behavioural issues that um, you uh, alluded to. And of course, you know, we have the the, the first um, round of that uh, showed um, that you know, there, there was, um, you know, in continuing to be net migration to Scotland, and uh, that was um, across all all bands. Uh, but you know, we're not complacent in any way, and we will continue to monitor uh, all of that to make sure that we are. Um, keeping uh, on top of um, any things that emerge. I think also you know, what is positive is um, you know, the the, uh, our, the average earnings growth um, is is up uh, and is up compared to the rest of the UK. Um, the number of top top rate taxpayers um, is uh, also up. This is on the figures, the latest figures that we have um, available. Um, and you know, Scottish tax performance ha has improved. So there is a you know a strong base there, but we're um, not complacent at all. I don't know whether Lucy, is there anything you want to add? Just to say that we're publishing a tax strategy alongside the budget um, on the fourth of December, mm -hmm. and that is going to look in more detail at a number of areas to see what actions we can undertake as a government to improve the certainty and stability of the of the tax process to improve evidence and evaluation gathering, to improve our communications and engagement, and to look at the current tax system in the round and the potential for future powers. So sort of kick the tires on all of that. And as part of the lead up to publication of the tax strategy, we've been doing a lot of engagement work, including with the business community on some of the behavioural issues that you flagged here. So we have the, the data that our HMRC published, our strategic business engagement, and uh, in addition to that, some the real-time evidence coming through from HMRC that helps us just to try and capture the behavioural implications of the policies that the government is undertaking. Mm. Yeah, could, I mean, obviously we can look at what's happening in other countries. I mean, Estonia, for example, has got a 20% straight tax across the board, incidentally. Mm. I don't think we're going to be in that position in Scotland any time soon. But yeah. I think having six tax bans doesn't help. 19, 20, and 21 per cent just seems daft, I think, to most people. I understand why it's brought in, but it's, it's a nonsense, isn't it, really? Well, I think our system is, is progressive. I think the UK system is, is certainly not. And you look at the, the, the bans um, uh, down south, I think if you look at those on uh, lower incomes, I think they are assisted by our tax system. Um, and you know, the the figures I shared with you about the, the growth in tax revenues, um, the fact that we have net migration of taxpayers uh, into Scotland, um, you know, I, I think would give evidence that. Um, you know, I'm not saying everything's perfect with the system, but that some of the, the claims of what would happen uh, with flight, etc., you know, have not come to pass. But we're not complacent, and we need to make sure. Which is why you know, tax strategy, which is why we, you know, have worked with HMRC to keep a very close eye on trends, emerging trends. Uh, so that we can you know, address those uh, if, if, we, if we require to. The Basque country, which has got 35 more years of devolution than we have, uh, tax devolution basically says that 2 or 3 per cent doesn't mean much. Once you get above that, you get you, the tipping point becomes quite dramatic. Mm. OK, I'm going to open up the, the, the session to call during the table. First uh, to ask questions will be Deputy Convener Michael to follow by Michelle. Thanks, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, uh, on the 30th of May of this year, you published the Scottish Government's pay policy, and that indicated an assumption of 3% uh, for um, pay awards. Uh, was that the figure that you used in establishing the 24-25 budget? Uh, so, yes, um, that was the figure. Um, and... Um, let me say a few things about why we um, ended up with that pay policy. Um, I should also say, um, you know, the, the, I'm very mindful of where we go with pay policy next, because um, 
we have to think about the purpose of pay policy. Is it about managing expectations or is it about driving expectations? Is it about signalling to the wider public sector about government's expectations? The UK government does not set a pay policy. And I don't think they've got any intention to. So I'm quite mindful about you know, what is the purpose of pay policy. Um, but the, the pay policy set out on at the end of May set out the multi-year uh, pay metrics, uh, and, um, and it took account of a number of things. It took account of affordability, known or based on the known funding at the time. So at the time, under the previous UK government, we had. Um, a position where there was a starting and suspending of spending reviews, budget dates moving. So we had to get the best estimate of the funding available. Very poor communication as well, I should add to that. So we had to set a pay policy based on what we thought the funding uh, that would be available was. Um, so affordability. Uh, also, we looked at the um, the economic conditions, inflation forecast to be 2% uh, for this year alone. Um, and we wanted to do that uh, two year um, or that multi year metrics uh, from 24, 25 to 26, 27 in order to give um, some certainty. Um, and what we said was anything on top of that would really need to be funded through efficiencies, which has happened in some sectors in order to fund pay deals. I should also say that the civil service unions have more or less settled for, uh, certainly for the 24-25 element of that pay policy. We're in, obviously in discussions about the future years. Um, so for, for civil service trade unions, um, that has resulted in a a positive outcome. And then there's the wider public sector. And the, the key thing here is the UK pay review bodies. Um, the UK pay review bodies um, recommendations, we had no idea what those would be. I think the level at which they set was a bit of a surprise to a number of people. Um, and then we had a choice of how do we respond to that. And um, the UK government, the new UK government, um, accepting those UK pay review body recommendations um, gave us a, a huge challenge. Um, and then saying that they were only going to fund them by two thirds, with the third having to be found by departmental savings, was another challenge. So all of that resulted in me having to take action with the, the savings. Uh, that I announced in order to create the headroom because there was an 800 million pressure created by those UK pay review body recommendations. And just finally on that, that was an issue of, that was discussed quite extensively at the Fisk in Belfast because there is a, an issue here about UK pay review bodies that have a, a con the contagion effect, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but essentially they, they then, you know, they they, they set the, the, the bar for um, what other sectors will land on, and we have no input to them, and we don't get any information about the, the, the workings of why they have landed where they've landed. And then the UK government can accept or not accept without any discussion with the devolved administrations. And I think what the four... Um, of us concluded was that we needed to do things better than that. There needed to be a way of coordinating around public sector pay across the UK in a way that doesn't um, give you know, and, and um, generate huge pressure for the devolved nations. And part of that is about the timing of them, and part of that is about input to them and the purpose of them. So um, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, I would say, is cognizant of all of that. And then we need to see where all of that gets to. And just finally, finally, because it is a, an area I've been thinking a lot about, I am keen to get away from single year pay deals and get into and maintain that multi-year look. And I think if we, with the spending review and knowing what the resource envelopes will be, is going to be incredibly helpful for us to be able to take 
uh, a multi-year look and potentially look at multi-year envelopes rather than single-year envelopes. And that will give um, our, you know, those negotiating on both sides in the, uh, in the public sector clarity about what the parameters are over a longer period and they can then look at how much is front-loaded, back-ended. You can look at reform and efficiencies as part of that as well. So I think we're, that is where I'm thinking towards. It does leave the question of 25-26, but you know, I will say something on paying workforce as part of the budget. But the the way I want to take it is on that multi-year basis. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but there is a lot of complexity in there. 3% okay. wasn't very realistic, was it? Well, that's what we could afford based on the budget intelligence we had of what the funding okay. availability was. I couldn't set a pay policy that, that didn't have the, the funds available to pay. Um, so we then needed, other, otherwise I would have had to have made savings right at the beginning and set out where we're going to set a floor because if I'd said 4% that would then become the floor. I would have had to have announced a whole swathe of savings at the okay. time to create that. Okay, so, so I understand and you've touched on this already in terms of negotiating tactics and, and it clearly has an impact in terms mm -hmm. of the, those dynamics. But the Scottish Fiscal Commission assumed 4.5% in their, the production of their work on the budget. So they didn't think it was realistic either. I mean, this accounts for, you said, what is the purpose of pay policy? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is over half of all public expenditure of your budget mm -hmm. um, and taxpayers' money spent in Scotland. And you have used it as the principal reason for the chaos that's resulted in recent weeks in terms of inflationary pressure and pay rises in your budget, which has resulted in £500 million of cuts directly, the exposure of the Scotland money, potentially a billion pounds overall, and you're reiterating some of that today. So the difference between that 3% and the 4.5%, when you've said to the Scottish Fiscal Commission that you will provide them with a policy, mm -hmm. in which they say, and they have reiterated to this committee, mm -hmm. that they are required to do their work and their modelling, how is it possibly justifiable? not to provide them with that pay policy ahead of time, particularly when it's clearly under-costed? Well, we will, and I will reflect on uh, so all will, of the so lessons. So you will provide a pay policy this well, year? Well, I will provide enough information for the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, that they require. Uh, but I'm mindful about a single-year pay policy in the context of a spending review that is coming shortly after and the opportunities that that provides. So okay. I want to put the context of 25-26 in that multi-year space. I also want to reflect on um, how we manage some of that uh, position in year where we don't essentially put a pay policy out that becomes the floor and the negotiation is therefore above that. Because this SFC at 4.5%, well, the pay review bodies were 5.5%. So we have all of these factors that play in to where pay actually lands. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is we need to construct something better than that. And also, there is a point of principle here. If the UK government is going to accept UK pay review body recommendations, then it really needs to fund them. And the problem I had was it said it wouldn't. It would only fund two thirds of them. Okay. Now, if they'd said at that point, we'll fund 100% of the pay review body recommendations, then I would have known the headroom I was going to have to be able to do that, but they didn't. So I couldn't wait to see whether at supplementary estimates in the spring we were going to see that funded. I had to take action, which is why the point you made, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say regard it as chaotic. What would have been chaotic would have been to have waited to the spring to see whether or not the money emerged. I couldn't do that. I had to create some headroom in expectation that they were talking about a third being funded by departmental savings. Well, our equivalent of that is what I had to bring to Parliament. So we have, um, in Scotland, there's 22.6% of total employment is mm -hmm. in the public sector in yeah. comparison to 17.6% of the UK mm -hmm. overall. Obviously, we contribute to that figure um, as well. And we also have a significantly higher um, a me median public sector wage than other parts of the UK. So I do understand in terms of a, a pay policy of 5% or 
ten percent or three percent is set, that's a much bigger impact in Scotland yes. than it is in other parts of the UK. But is yes. that not why this is so particularly important? That for the work of Parliament to scrutinise your budget, the budget you bring forward, that you tell Parliament what the assumptions you have made for pay are. And you've said within this that it's, you want to try and uh, include it within the next and the spending review across the piece. But we have to scrutinise the budget for the forthcoming year. Mm -hmm. And in the budget passed, we didn't know and couldn't we refused to be told what the assumption was. And we've got independent experts outside the Fraser Islander Institute being particularly critical of this, the fact that making just assumptions and com complete lack of transparency. So can you tell us now today that you will inform Parliament and the Scottish Fiscal Commission, just for clarity, I think you've said it already, but you will inform publicly your assumptions around pay for the next budget year? Well, I, w I will give Parliament the assumptions within an envelope. What I don't want to do, though, because of all the reasons I've set out, is to give a figure that then becomes a floor, that then becomes essentially um, that's the minimum uh, for pay policy, and that drives expectations that everything will be above that. And the other complexity here is that pay is not just about the pay policy figure, uh, it's also about the non-pay elements. So if you take the civil service unions, for example, part of the deal was the value of the shorter working week, which had a value, a percentage value, that was then part of the, 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 the pay policy for the civil service. So, so what I'm trying to, to say is it's more complex than just a figure for a year. And we need to recognise that complexity and we need to avoid pay policy becoming a driver. And we need to make sure that our negotiating teams have an envelope that they can work on that recognises all of that complexity. So what I'm looking at is, is, is more of a, a framework that can help over a number of a multi-year basis to uh, ensure that we can, through pay, address reform, we can address efficiency, we can address productivity, and all of these things can be part of that framework rather than just a figure, because so, that, I don't think that figure serves as yeah. well. And, and just on the point uh, about the larger civil service, that is correct, and therefore the Barnet consequentials don't cover it. And therefore, at budget, I will also it set out uh, our plans in terms of workforce and workforce um, uh, policy because they are inextricably linked and there is uh, an absolute relationship between uh, the sustainability of the public finances and the workforce uh, numbers and pay and all of that is, is inextricably linked. Uh, of course, um, our lower paid uh, staff in the public sector in Scotland are paid 10 per cent more than their uh, rest of the UK counterparts. So there is a benefit, of course, of course. to public sector pay yes. and the action we've taken and the investments that we've made in public sector pay. OK. Will, will you be then, on that basis, it sounds like you're not going to produce the public sector pay policy. We've not had one for the last two years. The SFC have come to committee and said that they expect to have it. They're very disappointed in the fact that they haven't had well, it. Is there any if I can. Is there anything else in the agreement that you have with the Scottish Fiscal Commission that you don't intend to provide them with this well, year? Well, so let me be clear, because um, I thought I had been clear, Michael, but Perhaps let me be not. clear to you again, because we Thank always you. like to be clear, don't we? Um, I will produce the information that the Scottish Fiscal Commission requires. What I'm saying, though, is I want to learn the lessons yeah. of single-year pay policy and to do something that is more meaningful. Okay. So, on, so, on that point, then, can yeah. I, so a suggestion from the Fraser of Allender is that they have said that um, you should set out what your assumption is mm -hmm. and your intent is, and then you should present scenario plans. So, for instance, in the past year, you set out for 24-25, and you've revealed today for the first time it was a 3% assumption. But were that to rise to 4% or to 5%, you would set out assumptions within that and scenario plans as to where you would take the money from the rest of your budget. Well, so that would, allow, that would allow, then, Parliament to scrutinise the budget and, understand, and also, frankly, in your negotiations, people to understand the consequences of some of the decisions you're making. This isn't my suggestion. This is the Fraser of Allender saying that this would be a different way 
of approaching prudently Scottish budgeting. Because we have, to, we have to accept at the moment that the budget's not in a very good state. So we well, would want a better I, process. Well, I, I don't accept that. What I do really? accept is that we've been trying to um, uh, essentially uh, work um, a, a budget through a set of absolutely um, chaotic UK government decisions that have now become less chaotic. And I think looking to 25, 26 and beyond, that is extremely helpful. But if you're trying to set a budget or pay policy or anything else with absolutely no idea of the funding that you're going to get, that becomes really difficult, whether it's about setting spending decisions, setting pay policy or anything else. So having a, an idea more in an earlier stage of the the year of what the budget is going to be, of what funding we can expect to receive from the UK government is, a, is transformational. It may sound a basic thing, but it's transformational. One point before this goes out of my head, that you know, if you're ever involved in negotiations, you'll understand the complexity of that and the importance of not driving um, pay inflation and recognising that it's not just about pay, it's about the efficiencies as part of that. Uh, so, for example, in rail, um, part of the pay deal uh, was linked to efficiencies. Um, and therefore, me coming and saying, well, in order to um, have a contingency in case it goes up to 5%, I'm going to what, cut the health budget? No. We would look, for example, at anything above the parameters we've set to be paid for by efficiencies and efficiency gains, productivity gains. So we've got to be careful what we say in pay policy. Otherwise, it drives very unhelpful uh, scenarios that are not helpful for the public purse. And I don't want to be cutting budgets uh, while we're in the process of negotiating, because that just drives wage inflation. So we've got to be careful about what we're setting out and what our expectations are. Um, but you know, I will, of course, look very carefully at and do at comments from Fraser of Allender, SFC and others. But I, I guess I just want to just uh, re-emphasise the point about how complex pay is. Mm -hmm and how important it is for us to be very careful around how we land pay policy. Okay. I mean, it's good that you reflect on those comments from SFC, because they have been very clear mm -hmm. with committee that they think this is an ex extremely concerning deficit in mm -hmm. the way that the budget is constructed. So, thanks, Kimbia. Thank you very much. Michelle, to be followed by Liz. Uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us. Uh, following on some of the themes, I've got quite a range of, of, of areas I want to cover, and they're sort of short, sharp uh, questions. Uh, productivity is an area that we often sort of mm. discuss, and we know that there's a massive issue. UK productivity is lower than France, Germany, and USA, and so on. It's a long-running issue. But I was interested in the, and I know you've written a letter to us about the delay of the infrastructure improvement plan. And I just wanted to hear your reflections on what the specific implications of that delay will be in the light of kind of behaviour changes, what will be stopped, what will be started. So what assessment have you made of the fact that there will be a delay to the publication of the plan in mm -hmm. terms of works that are going on internally? Yeah. So, um, so let me just say, first of all, on productivity, we absolutely recognise um, that productivity has to be part of the discussions that we have with all parts of the public sector. Mm -hmm. And there is um, a lot of evidence that, um, that since COVID, um, there hasn't been a recovery of some okay. of the levels of productivity. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, we understand a lot of them. Um, but it's really important that in driving forward uh, reform, particularly in health and social care, that we, we, need, we need to have a, um, a productivity as part of those discussions. Um, it's absolutely critical. Um, on the infrastructure investment pipeline, um, I mean, the simple fact is this, that until the spending review, the capital spending review in the spring, 
Uh, I'm going to have no idea what the capital budget is going to be from 2026 onwards. So trying to set out an infrastructure investment pipeline um, without knowing what the capital envelope is going to be doesn't strike me as being very sensible because it will do one of two things. It would, first of all, um, either constrain what we're doing, and you never know, there might be a change in the fiscal rules for capital and we might end up getting a bigger envelope. You can only hope. I'm not entirely sure that's where we'll end up, but there is a scenario where that happens. So we will have made decisions um, pre that, if we don't wait, um, that are based on a scenario that might change. The uh, second uh, thing is it might drive confidence down in terms of you know, as people want certainty. So I think those projects that are essentially uh, you know, in, the, in the, the, the potentially in the pipeline, we need to give certainty to them. And I don't want to have a stop and start. So saying something that then has to be immediately revisited, I think just doesn't, doesn't make sense. I have some sympathy uh, with what you're saying around that uncertainty, but there's a flip side, and it perhaps goes back to what Michael Mara was saying earlier about pay. Uh, if, if there's no planning at all, uh, I mean, you could, for example, have proceeded on the basis of the latest projections from the Scottish Fiscal uh, Commission, the ones that were, that were done earlier, and say, right, OK, that is the de minimis floor, and accept what you're saying about there could be a change to fiscal rules around debt. I, I think that's highly likely because mm -hmm. they're so constraining for the UK government. But what you're saying is, because we don't know, we can't do anything. But what I'm exploring is, but what could be done within, within that uncertainty? And surely something must be made certain, because otherwise, actually, we're just, you know, this lack of multi-year funding, which we all agree on, is, is stopping lots of things, and actually, arguably, mm -hmm. is stopping confidence in proceeding forward. I mean, there are obviously a number of capital projects that are yeah. ongoing, and you know. So yeah. what we're talking about here are, is 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 this, is having a line of sight and certainty for those that have yet have yet to to begin. Um, and I think my concern would be that if projects, um, if we were to say just now, well, we think that then a lot of money is potentially expended on those early mm -hmm. days of of preparation for business cases and so on and so forth. And I think we need to, I would rather wait until spring, which is not far off. And, and, and I should also say, I'm, um, my expectation with Treasury is that we're not going to have to wait until a day in spring until we get all the information. And I think the flow of information has been much better and it will begin, I am hopeful, to be get to, to be able to get some indications of direction of travel, so that come the spring, um, what I am intending to do is to is to um, publish the infrastructure investment pipeline alongside MTFS because it will take that longer uh, horizon, um, and for that to then give that certainty to hopefully a larger number of projects that can go ahead. Because at the moment we're facing that cut in capital. So if I was to just take what we have in terms of the infrastructure investment pipeline and apply that cut in capital, then clearly a number of projects will not be able to proceed. Yeah. Uh and what are your intentions? The, the fiscal framework outturn uh, report said that there was still 398 million capital headroom for the end of 2025 to 2026. Uh, what's your intention uh, for that? So, I mean, we take a very, you know, a prudent approach in terms of borrowing, and we set ourselves some you know, internal rules around uh, what we think is prudent. Um, and essentially that is the landing spot uh, for those internal guides, if you like. I don't know if, um, Jenny, do you want to come in on a little yeah. bit on that? Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, I think um, that the Cabinet Secretary will take the decision around the capital borrowing um, as part of the budget process. So we're not yet in a position where we've made a, a firm decision around the level of capital borrowing. 
um, for 25, 26. Um, the amount of capital borrowing in 24, 25 is also net, not yet absolutely confirmed. So the number that's in the budget is 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 to be confirmed, mm -hmm. and the cabinet secretary takes those decisions much closer to the end of the financial year. Um, alongside, uh, in order to deliver a balanced um, outturn mm. position at the end. So there's a few moving parts which we'll uh, take stock on uh, ahead of publication of the draft mm. budget in December. Uh, uh, and thank you for that. I appreciate that. In terms of rules, are you applying <laughs> rules to headroom contingency, mm -hmm. whatever you want to use? I, I mean, I think it would be useful for this committee to understand that because, mm -hmm. as you know, as a side issue, we're always looking for greater transparency, so well, I think it'd be useful I, to... I'm happy to write to the committee just with you know, wh where our guides would be around, uh, uh, around making sure that we're being prudent. Um, I think just to add as well that we have been putting a, a lot of effort into exploring potentially other ways of um, reven revenue-based um, options for for capital you know, um, and we've been I mean we have some good examples of, of that already um, in the local government sphere with outcomes based funding for example through the leap project was a good example of or is a good example of that so we are um, we're not resting on our laurels that it's just a, a, around a, you know CDL and uh, availability we are looking at what else it, we can potentially lever in here, but of course that comes at a revenue cost, yeah. and that has to be uh, affordable uh, over the longer period of time as well. Okay, and moving on, uh, I just wanted to finish off this sort of theme about productivity, and I know R and D, research and development, has already been brought up by the convener, and it's a very important part. But housing also, arguably, is in there, and obviously the mm. programme for government figures would set out. But I suppose my question is that given both the, the, the impact on productivity, never mind uh, child poverty, obviously, which is one of the government's key kind of drivers, uh, is the plan to restore the cut of 200 million for housing in the budget? Well, look, I have said on a number of occasions that uh, housing mm. investment is a, a key priority for, for capital. Um, I mean, we have uh, faced two things. One is the, the, the cut to CDL, mm -hmm. and that's um, uh, you know, eight percent, just almost eight percent, eight eight point eight eight point seven, um, and on top of that, financial transactions cut of sixty two percent, which underpinned the affordable housing supply programme. We raised that issue directly with the chancellor and asked her what her view was on financial transactions and whether the uh, new uh, UK Labour government would take a different view on financial transactions. She said she would go away and look at that um, and we're going to pursue that and continue to pursue it because it was, um, you know, it, it was what underpinned our affordable housing programme. Yeah. And, uh, to have replaced that with CDL would have meant swinging cuts elsewhere mm. to be able to, to do that. So, so I need to see how those various discussions play out and the point about the fiscal rules uh, and what the capital outlook uh, looks like. There are, um, so I know that colleagues in uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Shirley Ann Somerville uh, and Paul McClellan have been looking at how they also use some of the funding to lever in private sector investment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they were talking about the, uh, the 100 million that they were looking to invest would uh, lever in 500 million, and that would deliver, um, I think it was 2,800 mm -hmm. mid-market rent homes. So we need to be imaginative about how we grow that mm -hmm. pot to help deliver across all levels of affordability. Obviously, that it's not social housing, but it is affordable housing and it meets a really mm. big need in the market. Um, so, in short, it is a key priority for us. We've got yeah. to have 
the budget discussions around cabinet, around the, the relative priorities here, but I think where I've been, everybody's been very clear, it is a, a key priority. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few wee, uh, random uh, questions. I noticed that the, uh, there's now uncertainty over the growth deal for Argyll and Butte. Uh -huh. uh, have you had a chance to explore uh, if any other growth deals that that's now introduced uncertainty? I'm thinking in particular, and perhaps selfishly, the Falkirk growth deal, or rather the promise of, of, of funds that have not yet been mm -hmm. sort of finally uh, agreed. Are there any concerns over any of the other growth deals? So we, I raised this directly with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and um, um, our understanding and what we've been told is that all the, the city deals, growth deals that were signed are, are fine. Okay. Uh, Argyll and Butte wasn't signed, so it was a timing issue. So it is, if you like, on hold. We've committed our share to the Scottish okay. Government. And I raised very directly uh, with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury the need for certainty and, and swift resolution, because it shouldn't, it's a bit unfair if it just comes down to a timing issue. Um, there, are, there is a question mark around some of the other, so the levelling up funds, and, you know, I think. Uh, my view is, despite all the reservations that we had about the way um, you know, funds were uh, deployed, I think there's a, a roundabout that was purchased by the UK government in the border somewhere. I mean, you know, we need to be more strategic mm -hmm. about the use of our collective uh, capital uh, here. Uh, what I wouldn't want to see, though, is money taken off of towns and cities and communities that were promised. I, don't, I just don't think that's a, a starter. So I think we do need to have clarity, but then going forward, we need to spend these resources in a much more strategic way, and, and I'm very much up uh, for that. Um, and you know, I also made very clear, just as a, like a tangential point, but still in this, you know, when, it, when, when we're looking at shared prosperity funding, for example, you know, that has to be rooted through devolved administrations. Everybody around the table was saying that to the Chief Secretary. We need to be able to use all of these resources mm -hmm. in a more strategic, coherent way. And efficient. Uh, efficient, well, absolutely. Yeah, um, just again, uh, just a couple more like, questions. Scottish bonds, what's the sort of latest on that? So um, we are continuing to uh, look uh, at the issue of bonds. Um, as you remember, it was a, a, an investor panel recommendation, yeah. um, and uh, we are um, continuing to look. We're doing due diligence, due diligence process uh, on all of that, and I'm going to provide more information on this at the Scottish Budget. Um, I mean, we have to make sure that um, you know issuing a bond would have to be at the right time. Um, and you, so we need to look at market conditions and all, all of that. Um, so work continues. I'm happy to keep the okay. committee updated. OK. And last wee question uh, in terms of airport passenger duty. Mm -hmm. Is there any update on what the status of that is? Because there's been quite a lot of talk in recent weeks about private jets and so on. But yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, you'll understand, obviously, the complexity um, of this, uh, not least that you know we need to make sure um, that the Highlands and Islands uh, are uh, protected. Um, uh, so we have um, continued to uh, discuss this with uh, the UK government um, in terms of the subsidy control regime. Of this is a new government in, so mm -hmm. we're engaging with them around this to see if we can move things uh, forward. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll set out the high-level principles of the uh, air departure tax, um, including, importantly, how it will support uh, emissions reductions. And we're going to do that as soon as possible. And we're going to review the rates and bans, uh, including the rates on private jet flights, uh, to ensure that they're aligned with um, net zero ambitions. Um, so that work continues, but we, we need obviously to resolve the, the issue with the, with the UK government mm. on, uh, on subsidy control. And my, my final, final question, convener, which is one I've asked before. Was... Your final, final, final question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, convener. Uh, is around the, the Scotland monies, which mm -hmm. you know I've raised before, yep. both in here and in chamber. 
uh, and I, I know if, if money can be salvaged for good purposes, it will be. But the question needs to be asked that if it ends up needing to be used for this year, what assessment now are you making for when that money won't be available for subsequent years? Because that's obviously a concern as well. Yeah, so, um, so Scotland is uh, non-recurring in itself. There's obviously more money coming through the likes of Intog. Um, and we can expect, I think, fifty-four million from from that um, in 24-25. Um, but uh, you'd have seen in the um, the autumn uh, um, uh, revision there was, um, I think, four two four set aside from Scotland. Um, um, but um, and let me, you know, be clear again: we are bearing down um, very. Uh, um, strongly on on costs and all of the the measures we've taken around recruitment controls, um, non-essential spend. We are uh, driving that down with the very um, explicit um, desire to minimise the use of Scotland um, for the reasons that we've rehearsed a number of times. That. And um, when we talked about capital earlier on, you know that um, is a potential source of in infrastructure and investment yep. um, in um, many of the strategic um, areas that we need to make progress on. And having that um, uh, at our disposal, or as much of it as possible, is a, an absolutely clear objective for me. Um, and I'll continue to. To, to keep the committee updated on progress. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you. Liz, to be followed by Ross. Uh, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, earlier today, um, Ms O'Carroll confirmed that on the 4th of December, when you have the budget, um, there will be the publication of the tax strategy mm -hmm. as well. Um, can I ask you how many times um, since the general election has that tax strategy group met? Um, can we just get the, the note of how many times it's met? I'll get that for you in a, a second. Um, I have, I think, attended all bar one or two of the meetings. Um, they have been very productive and quite a wide range of views in the room, as you can imagine. Um, but um, they have um, been very productive. And in addition to... Um, the tax strategy group. I've also had some wider sessions with um, key stakeholders in advance of the tax strategy um, being published, just to take, um, I think, well, just to do that, to take a wider range of views on uh, what the tax strategy should do, what it should um, uh, help us to achieve, and testing out the objectives and the the, and the drafts that are within uh, that. Um, so, do we have? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So, um, so it has met uh, three times uh, this year. Um, but in addition to that, there's been work in between meetings that has gone on to um, basically further uh, uh, some of the uh, the work um, to get us to the point that's very advanced at this stage. Um, that I've been able to go out to that wider group of stakeholders with so, the so product. Is, is, is that three times since the general election it's met? Um, I think three, three, three times this year. year. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, just to be very specific, yeah. since the general election, how many? Um, once, I think. Is it once? once or twice. We once or twice. I can write to you with the dates. Yeah, um, I, I'm interested because... Um, there's obviously been discussion about what the objectives, the principles mm -hmm. are behind the Scottish Government's uh, tax uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if the uh, issue about competitiveness has been added to that uh, overview um, of the tax strategy. Well, I think the, the tax strategy is seeking to do a number of things, which is um, about, about certainty uh, for taxpayers, about raising awareness of mm -hmm. our system. Mm -hmm which was an issue um, raised quite strongly in that wider forum uh, of, of stakeholders who um, were concerned that um, there might not be the level of awareness about... Um, well, there's a lot, lack of awareness about tax systems, UK and Scottish, but the need for us to 
um, to be uh, to look at ways of sharing information and making people raising awareness. Yeah, um, I, I understand these um, uh -huh. uh, principles, Cabinet Secretary. But can we be very specific about asking whether the issue of competitiveness mm -hmm. uh, is it in there about the uh, Scottish Government's tax strategy? Well, uh, yes, and, and that issue has been discussed and raised by members of, of the group. Um, what it's not, though, it's not a, a group that is essentially determining tax policy, um, as in you know, where we land with uh, tax rates. Um, it is a group that's looking at you know, where where does tax strategy need to land that um, makes sure that people uh, that we we maximise awareness so that compliance is high, that we uh, have a system that is fair and understandable and and and, and easy to to navigate, uh, that we have one that um, takes cognizance of driving behaviours and mm, yeah, that I'm, is I'm just coming uh, to that yeah, um, yeah. issue about behaviours because I mean the tax strategy obviously has to. Uh, drive e delivering economic growth and improving mm -hmm. the economy and well-being, etc. Yep. I mean, and that's obviously yep. uh, got to be up there. And why I'm asking about competitiveness is that you know uh, there are also people out there in the, in the world of uh, business and industry mm -hmm. who are making the point that the, the competitive uh, side of the tax strategy is extremely important because if we are going to deliver much greater economic growth and you know, much better out mm -hmm. outturn for the economy then we have to have a competitive uh, tax structure. And I would have thought that that was central uh, to the government. And uh -huh. I, I just flag up the, the comment that um, the Deputy First Minister made at the end of uh, August uh, when she said that, and I quote, continually raising taxes is ultimately counterproductive because revenue falls and this impacts on potential investment. And obviously we've had um, various bits of evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission before this committee who've argued that at some of the top level uh, of tax uh, systems, we, we've got a, a, a problem about potential behavioural change. So I just wondered, in terms of your tax strategy, never mind the tax rates, but mm -hmm. the tax strategy, are you measuring the different tax elasticities and the, um, the behavioural change that is re likely to result from the tax policies that you have just now? So I'll come back to that specifically in a second. But on the tax strategy, um, you know, we have. Um, so I've had a lot of meetings with the Deputy First Minister around this directly. Um, so as well as the certainty and stability, um, aligning our economic and tax strategies has been a, a focus um, of the of the work. Um, and more regular and uh, systematic engagement. Um, improving how we approach evidence and evaluation, administration and delivery of the current system and future priorities. So, although it's quite high level, it is seeking to align the objectives uh, there. What I would say about the specifics and the and the evidence is, I, would, I guess, I would point to some of the comments I made earlier on that you know we we have engaged you know HMRC and others around um, that uh, evidential base, and you know we are um, the evidence, uh, albeit it takes you know the, the period of time um, uh, to a point um, of the latest available evidence. Um, and then there will be future evidence uh, at a future point. But for the period of time that it looks at, you know, there is a net, net um, my positive migration of uh, across all bands to Scotland. Um, and we've seen a, a growth in earnings um, that is, is very strong. So I guess, you know, if you're asking me, is there evidence there that I should be really worried about um, that there is, you know, flight, uh, or um, disincentive that is putting people off coming. I would say that the, the balance is people are still coming uh, to, to live and work in Scotland, and that will be for a whole variety of reasons about why people make that choice. But I'm not complacent about that, and we want to continue, which is why the point about you know con continuing to improve the evidence and evaluation um, is important, mm. and we'll continue with HMRC and others to make sure that you know, we, we monitor all of that and, importantly, you know, respond. 
Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there are some businesses who are very concerned about the potential in the future for uh, difficulties with recruitment because they feel that you know some of the medium to higher earners are being put off. Um, now, I think what's important is when we get to the tax strategy, will you be producing the, um, the evidence behind what uh, is driving the strategy? Namely, will we get the evidence to be able to see what the different elasticities are, are at the present time and whether the behavioural change is um, as we suspect it is? Well, a lot of that evidence is already in the public domain. The HMRC work, I'll bring Lucy in in a second. I mean, that, that is what I've been referring to. That evidence is there that shows that this net, net migration and that actually, you know, and even with our, our top rate payers, there's, there's growth. Um, and many of our sectors, like financial services, are, are you know, booming in, in Scotland. Now, that's not to dismiss anecdotal evidence or con, con, uh, you know, concerns that are raised, because we, you know, we have to listen to those. But I'm, all I'm saying is that the evidence that is there so far um, you know, should give us some confidence. But we have to be vigilant about that. So, can I just bring Lucy in? Sorry, just on <coughs> So just to make two points, the first of those is that in the run-up to the production of the tax strategy, we've been engaging with a wide range of institutions. We've had two stakeholder-led roundtables, one led by the Scottish Financial Enterprise and one by David Hume Institute. We've had two that are official-led and two that are ministerial-led. We've had a, attendees ranging from Oxfam to... Um, the um, Scottish Women's Budget Group to ICAS, CIOT, the, the tax experts. We've had one-to-one -one engagements with Institute for Fiscal Studies, with Institute for Government, with Fraser Valander and so forth. And um, we've met with academics and we've had uh, events with COSLA and uh, local authority economy directors. So we've, we've tried to, to reach out to address some of the issues around competitiveness and capture their work and their evidence as well as looking at our own. The second point I would make is that in the tax strategy itself, we are looking at a number of objectives and how to achieve those mm. through a series of actions. Mm. And one of those actions is on evidence and evaluation. Mm. And we'll be setting out the areas that we would wish to explore more within the period of the current parliament to capture uh, the, the, the best evidence on areas around elasticities and behaviour and competitiveness. So it's really setting out that, that roadmap and those areas of research interests in the tax strategy so that uh, it gives people within Scotland assurance that we're looking systematically when future policy is being established, debated and chosen at these very important points that you and others have raised yeah. within uh, our stakeholder engagement. Th thank you. That's a very useful uh, update. I mean, it, when the tax strategy is published on the 4th of December, is it your intention, Cabinet Secretary, to be able to present to Parliament that we will be able to see within the current structures of tax what is working well in terms of the objectives that you have set and what is not working well? Um, I mean, the evidence um, has been produced externally around you know, what is, you know, who's coming and who, what's driving uh, behaviour, the growth in uh, tax revenues. So, I, I mean, a lot of that evidence is... Is, is external evidence. Now, what I could do, and we can put some thought about how do we perhaps um, you know, align some uh, links and references <coughs> around some of that evidential base alongside the, the tax strategy so that people can have um, reference points to you know, what, what lies behind, if that's yeah. your... Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the tax strategy is crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, for all sorts of economic reasons and perhaps social reasons too, mm -hmm. and therefore it makes it easier uh, for the scrutiny of, um, of of the budget and also uh, beyond. And mm -hmm. um, if, if we can see within that tax strategy what the government's interpretation is of the current evidence about the tax structures that are working well in terms of delivering better economic outcomes and where there are problems, uh, some of which have obviously been evidenced by different okay. businesses. That, that's what we're looking okay. for. Okay, well, I'll take that away just to reassure myself that we're able to... Okay. You know, um, my, my final point um, is about um, expanding 
uh, the tax base, which I think mm -hmm. the convener uh, referred to earlier. Can you tell us what uh, are the priorities of policies that you have in Scottish Government just now to try to expand the tax base? Mm -hmm. Well, I think twofold. One is to make sure that through um, our continued success at uh, you know, um, inward investment, being able to grow in terms of key sectors, uh, green energy, uh, all of the, the growth uh, around um, that, which is funded uh, partly through our priorities um, through SNIB and others, uh, the commitments of 500 million over five years to help lever in some of that um, private investment, which is very successful. There's a lot happening in that sphere. Um, and then there's the other key um, uh, sectors, uh, whether that's uh, financial services, life sciences, AI, and so on. So our economic uh, institutions and SNIB, uh, we would expect to align around um, making sure that we continue our success of, of growth in those areas. Um, and that, um, essentially, we want to create opportunities for people here, but also to bring people to work, live and work in Scotland. And actually, some of that will be in our more remote and rural communities, yep. which is great to see. So if you look at the Cromarty Firth and the work around the Green Freeport, it's amazing, the, the potential transformation and the potential housing development and all of that. Then there is the other uh, um, end of the spectrum, if you like, uh, where we want to get more people into work. So the, the work that we're doing, and I mentioned some of that earlier on around employability, getting parents into work, um, uh, that is important as well because it has the added benefit then of reducing um, the, 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 the need for supports that we provide both at a, a UK level and, and Scotland. So I guess in a nutshell, um, growing the economy in those key sectors you know, keeping people here, living in Scotland, but also um, expecting uh, net in migration from those, particularly in those highly skilled areas. Um, I mean, you look at the Western Isles, for example. They, you know, they could. They, they've said to me that they could employ every young person in the the the, the work that's going on around the offshore wind developments. Mm. But they're still going to need yeah. people to come and live and work in the yeah. islands, and that's really important for repopulation and all of that. Sure. So, but the tax strategy will set out how we widen the. So tax the tax base. strategy linked to the economic strategy, which looks at all of that and making sure those are linked, is the key reason that we are linking them because there has to be a coherence. And that's why I've been meeting with the Deputy First Minister to make sure that we can describe all of that and that all of our economic strategy and tax strategies are all pointing in the same direction. And that's um, what the, the work that we've been doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, before by Jamie. Thanks, Convener. I've got a couple of questions around the um, national performance framework and local government mm -hmm. finance as Cabinet Secretary. But before I get to them, Michelle Thompson's lines of questioning were quite interesting. There's a few points I'd like to, to follow up. Okay. The first is around um, air passenger duty, air departure tax, um, and the issues around uh, resolving the subsidy uh, mm -hmm. control point on lifeline routes. Mm -hmm. Are you able to confirm if the, the new UK government is at least in agreement in principle uh, on uh, the need to, to resolve this, that we do need to deliver on something we all agreed to devolve 10 years ago, but that we need to protect these, uh, the support to these lifeline routes? So I've got nothing to say they don't. Um, I've got, so we are, that is our assumption, that they are in principle in agreement, and it's about the how and, and getting on with it. So I've got, I have no intelligence to tell me uh, otherwise that there's been a shift away from that principle. So that is our working assumption. And I, I think... I'm not the, the person who's been closest to the dialogue with the new UK government on uh, some of the detail around this, but we can follow up with the committee in terms of what exchanges of correspondence there's been. That so, would be useful. Thanks yeah. very much. Okay. Um, and just on the, the point around um, bonds, could you just confirm the, the government's position in relation to the value for money mm -hmm. uh, with bonds? I recognise there's a lot of work being done to assess uh, their value for money, but um, concerns being raised that they are unlikely to be of greater value than regular borrowing, particularly given that it's the same overall limit. Would the government go ahead with issuing bonds even if they were found to be of less value than the regular borrowing options currently available? Well, part of the due diligence is, of course, about value for money test. 
and, and because of you know, changing market conditions, we won't really be able to, to be definitive on that until we're at, we would be at a point of when you would issue a bond, what is the market, what are interest rates, what's the, um, you know, how would uh, that compare to um, conventional borrowing? So, so value for, the value once, once for money test... Sorry? So, so once we get to that point, though, if, if at that point it's clear based on prevailing market conditions that a bond is a, would be of less value, you would end up paying uh, more back in the long run um, than the regular borrowing through the loan board. The government presumably wouldn't go ahead with issuing a bond well, at that point. I mean, the value for money test isn't the only test. I mean, obviously, part one of the reasons the investor panel uh, recommended this was the signal it sends about investment. Um, on a global stage, and th that's quite an important thing in itself. However, the value for money test is critical. Um, so, you know, if I, can, I can assure you that, um, you know, as, the, as part of the due diligence, you know, value for money is, is absolutely critical. But we're at quite a, an early stage. I don't know, um, Lucy or. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have much more no. to add. Only to say that I think the point about the value for money. Um, the, the different aspects brought into the value for money assessment are quite broad. They would go beyond a pure financial yeah. assessment yeah. and into the broader impact that issuing a bond might have in terms of the impacts the investor panel mm. were really seized upon about um, being a basis for attracting and crowding an inward investment. Yeah. So I think the, the issue would be about the breadth of that and the, the confidence levels we had around those yeah. assessments. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and moving on then to, to the other areas planned on asking about. Um, just first on local government finance reform, the joint working group with COSLA hasn't um, met since the government changed back in April. Should we re read much into that? Why, why is that the, the case that it's been so long since that group last met? So, um, so the group um, itself, you're right, it hasn't, it, it's actually meeting this month. Um, but I wouldn't want in any way for that to, to be a kind of signal that there's been a lack of activity. So there's been a lot of activity on the recommendations that the group had made. So as you're aware, visitor levy and uh, other um, things that emanated out of that working group have, um, have been taken forward uh, in between the meetings, if you like. Um, and I guess, you know, there was significant interruption um, from when the, the group last met, I think it was in April, then had, you know, election and a change of first minister and all of the engagement with COSLA. I, I think I meet COSLA on at least once a week at the moment. So all the people that are around that um, joint working group are the folk in the room when I'm meeting with them. Um, I've got, a, you know... Um, I think, uh, well, I think it is fair to say um, that um, I probably meet uh, them more than uh, anyone else at the moment. But, you know, given my local government hat, that is understandable. So we're working through one of, so one of the fiscal framework, um, although it's not formally in place yet, but one of the key uh, aspects of it was early engagement around the budget. So that has happened. So uh, Katie Hagman and I have met, I think, Two, three, four occasions to talk about um, the budget, and uh, in fact, there's been three meetings on uh, budget matters with the fourth due this week. This note tells me, which I think is about right. And then we've got you know broader engagement on some of the strategic issues that are um, of importance. So there's been no lack of engagement, um, and you know whether it's that one forum or another forum, it's what is discussed and what the outcome from it is, it's probably the more important thing. I absolutely agree on, on that. And on exactly that, what is your expectation for outcomes by the end of this parliamentary term on local government finance reform? You know, is there an ambition to have got to March, April 26 and have made a decision on council tax re-evaluation or a replacement system or additional new powers that are mm -hmm. entirely separate to that? What is what is your expectation of where we will be? How much will have actually changed by then, or how much will at least be in motion by then, recognising that some of these are multi-year and quite complex reforms? Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, let me, let let me start with the the kind of easier bit, and that is um, some of the progress that's being made around the principles of. Um, 
uh, more flexibility, uh, more um, financial powers. So these are things that we're progressing in the here and now. Um, and um, given that you know, count fundamental council tax reform is harder and longer, it, it takes longer to do. So um, getting on with some of that um, fiscal empowerment, if you like, with more levers um, is important. I think for me, um, I, some of that depends on whether we can build a degree of cross-party consensus about the ambition around council tax reform, because you know we've been round the houses um, on you know, what what would what would a fundamental replacement look like, and I think where I would want to get to is 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 to try and get a level of cross-party agreement about what the most important changes need to be. Um, and if we can get to that stage by the end of this parliamentary process, then it would potentially stand the next parliament in better stead to make some further progress on reform. Can I just ask specifically on that? Because I totally agree on the need for cross-party consensus. The working group leading this only has representatives of your party on it because mm -hmm. it's a Scottish Government working group. So yeah. what's the space in which that cross-party consensus emerges? Yeah, I don't think it's the, the joint working group because it does a whole range of other things like looking at you know visitor levy yeah. and all the detail around um, some of that. Um, I think it, it's, um, it, it's probably external to, to that and it's really, I guess, um, trying to forge some discussions uh, in this place, that are perhaps, you know, um, you know, could could uh, uh, out with the, the the budget discussions, um, but looking at what opportunities exist, given we're going to be in a better place with multi-year budgets, is there a, a landing space for some more significant reform to council tax that we could? have some general agreement around the principle of... Now, that's easy to say, much harder to achieve. But without it, it's difficult to see how you can move forward significant reform. I mean, we could all, you know, we could... Um, and, I, and I'm keen to take the views of, of external stakeholders on, on this. And I know you are uh, keen as well that there's a bit of kind of civic society involvement yeah. in all of that. The only thing I'm mindful of is that, that you know they could reach a position of saying, well, we think A, B, and C, but you know the the the, the fact of the matter in this place it doesn't garner enough political support. So I'm keen on that, and I'll just make an open invitation, I think, to have some honest discussion about where is a, a landing space. Um, I don't think anyone would say the council tax is perfect and that there are not important changes that need to be made. Um, and if we take that as a starting point, what are the changes that we could largely agree the principles on? On exactly that, um, Council Tax, far from perfect, hasn't been in date in my lifetime, and I'm 30 now. Would you like to see revaluation in this parliamentary term? Well, I'm very mindful of, well, it takes a lot longer to, to do any. Yeah, would, would you like to yeah. say start the process of so revaluation? I'm very mindful of big bangs and how difficult they can be. Uh, and the Welsh Labour government experience of this, I think, should make us just think about how uh, um, we address the point, and there is a point here about property values being 30 plus years out of date. But, um, you know, there are. We have to try and take people with us on this journey. Now, there are ways of moving forward, and I think there's some um, discussion in Wales now, and possibly England as well, and I sound to be corrected, but I think there is around a gradual, you know, uh, is it at the point of a house sale? Is it at the point yeah. of, you know, so that you would do it in a way that is a soft landing over time? rather than a big bang of revaluation, which I think just scares the horses. And, you know, I think the Welsh Labour government have found that to be pretty difficult. They did one, and then they were looking at 
and other, and I think have had quite a significant pushback. So I'm really very wary of a kind of big bang on revaluation, but perhaps getting public support to do something. Because actually, you know, from the point of, of view of fairness, um, you know, there needs to be a gradual recognition um, of, of changes that have happened over decades. But I would want to try take people with me on that journey. Thanks very much. I've not asked about the National Performance Framework yet. I'm conscious of time, though. Can there, do I have time for that? We're really struggling for time, actually, that, to be that's honest. Fine. To Given to people it, to that's come the in next session with another cabinet, cabinet secretary, secretary to come back session. to it. OK, thank I'd thank actually you. get questions on capital public sector reform and digitalisation, which I wouldn't be able to ask unless colleagues do because of time. So uh, I sympathise with you. Uh, Jamie, to be followed by John. Thanks very much. Just, um, just talking about imperfect taxes before I move on to my main points. Um, I met with some uh, local businesses, hospitality and leisure tourism in Fort William, and they were concerned over the visitor levy tourism tax and the implications on VAT, because VAT is going to be, the way it's being set up, VAT is going to be uh, is going to be incurred on top of the uh, tax, so essentially they're being taxed twice. Is that something that you're concerned of? Do you think that's fair? And is there any action you're taking to try and remedy that? Well, look, the, the visitor levy is, is, is a local uh, levy that councils can choose to uh, deploy or not to deploy. And I think we either, um, you know, you, you're either on in agreement that councils should have fiscal powers, given you know the, um, their desire for more fiscal autonomy and flexibility and growing the quantum uh, that they have at their disposal, or, or you don't. Um, and Sorry, I think the, the question is about how it's been set up, not about local government well, utilising it. Look, so it's, been it's been set up in a way which means that the the levy itself incurs VAT. Is that is that? Are you happy enough? So, I mean, there was extensive consultation, and I think Tom Arthur was asked about this on a number of occasions and, and mm -hmm. addressed it at the time. Um, um, I'm happy to, to come back to the committee um, around whether or not there's... I think there was ve very limited room for manoeuvre of what could be done, given that VAT is a reserved issue. Um, so um, I remember, I can't remember the detail of it, but I remember Tom Arthur addressing this point at the time. I mean, the, the, prob the problem is by putting it on the businesses rather than on the individuals to pay the tax, uh -huh. the business businesses are therefore liable. That's going to push a number of them into the, over the VAT threshold, as well as, as I say, taxing them twice yeah. on it. So yeah. this is how it's been, but, but you confirm there's no consideration at the moment. Well, to change. I, will, I will come back to you on that, because okay. uh, if there is, it's not what the, anything I'm aware of, but it might be somewhere else within government in terms of picking up the implementation issues around okay. this. So let me take that away, because with, as with any levy, mm. when th something new is uh, delivered, we always look at the implementation issues and what arises. So I want to just check on that before okay. um, confirming okay. one I mean, of the I mean, I would have thought perhaps if that was being considered, it'd be something that would have been certainly run past your office. But okay, can I move on? Because I'm conscious of time. Um, there's been a lot of uh, um, a lot of focus, obviously, on the winter fuel payments, the decision by mm. the UK Labour government to means test and the implications for Scotland of what's now a devolved um, a devolved uh, benefit. Um, has the Scottish government made a request to defer the block grant adjustment? Well, we haven't decided yet in terms of the block grant adjustment and we'll make those decisions in due course uh, as part of our budgetary considerations but you know it, it, it's one thing to devolve the power but if the funding isn't devolved then it's something that's half devolved effectively. No, no, I, 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 I appreciate that and I, I do accept that if the block grant adjustment was to be deferred the funding would still have to be paid back. I think yeah. that's been mm -hmm. really established. But you're suggesting that you haven't made a decision on it. Mm -hmm. um, is there a time scale you have to make that request by? Um, well, we will, um, I'll move in Jenny in, but we will be looking at this as part of our budget in terms of um, the, 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 the best uh, landing space for us, because obviously there is a material issue in terms of which year the block grant adjustment is applied to. Uh, Jenny. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the issue around the timing of that decision, um, we're in discussion at official level with Treasury to really bottom out the timing of that, but our understanding is that that would relate to the timing of the supplementary estimates and the timescales that Scottish Government needs to submit 
um, its, its requests around the supplementary estimates process, which will be towards, very close towards the end of this, financial, uh, this calendar year or into January. And the fiscal framework does enable us, um, if I remember correctly, to be able to defer uh, block grant adjustments. That is part of the fiscal framework. But the question for us is, you know, what makes sense? And that's why those discussions are ongoing. But, you know, we'll okay. be fully transparent around, you know, the, once decisions are uh, brought to a conclusion. I, 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 help, that, that is helpful. So you haven't made a decision on it yet? I mean, no. we've known, particularly around the winter fuel payments, that since, I think it was, whenever it was, um, the UK government made this announcement that this is happening. Um, You've told us when you've got a deadline of the end of this calendar year, but that suggests that this year's winter fuel payments won't be made. So they ruled out. Uh, well, so the winter fuel payment will be made by the DWP um, to Scottish recipients uh, this winter, is my understanding. Right. Uh, so that will continue um, until uh, essentially the, um, the, the, the it would, and then the year after that um, it would be issued. Um, through um, Social Security Scotland, is my understanding. But w what, what was not able to be done, um, there would have had to have been a whole new system set up for um, a payment on a universal basis that was going ahead to be set up through Social Security Scotland. And that is now not happening because we don't have the 160 million to deliver it. So it's going to have to be delivered on a like for like basis with this year because of timing being delivered by uh, the DWP. I think that was right. all set out to Parliament. Anyway. May I, if I may just add, add one point, just to clarify. So the, the block grant adjustment that was due to the Scottish Government in this financial year was based on the amount of money estimated that the UK government would spend on that mm -hmm. benefit in England and Wales, yeah. and an estimated amount to, to be uh, for our block grant to be adjusted upwards in recognition of the benefit being devolved. So there will still be a smaller, a smaller block grant, positive block grant adjustment for the Scottish government because. The, that benefit continues. It's just it, it will it will cost, however, cost the UK government less because of it being targeted. Mm -hmm. So there will be some. The question around the deferral of the impact is of the is of the is of the reduction in that block positive block grant, and the and the um, option open to Scottish government is whether to take that adjustment this year mm -hmm. or to defer that into a future year. Yeah. I appreciate it. So can I just confirm, and when you're talking about the winter fuel payments being made this year, are you talking about the reduced means-tested amount? Yes. So not the full amount? No. Uh, so not, well, not the full, the, the, who, you know, all those would, who would have been entitled to the full amount if it wasn't means-tested? Well, well, I think we made that clear that we're having to follow a UK government policy because we don't have the money to retain it no, on okay. a universal I, I, I just basis. wanted to clarify that because you're... Yeah. you're well, I we just can't. Wanted... I mean, well, that's been the whole debate. I mean, we've... No, no, I, I'm aware of the debate and I'm aware of it. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to be very clear when you, when you talked about the, the windfall, you, windfall payments, you are talking about the adjusted amount means well, tested. Had, yeah. So, so but, but if you were to request a block grant a full block grant adjustment to, for the full amount, which you'd be entitled to, or you'd be able to, that full amount of money, as in uh, the amount of money that would have been made available without means, to, to, uh, without means testing, um, that would still be available to the Scottish well, Government, or be, yeah, that, would, or be that it would have to be paid back. Well, yeah, but so, so if what you're saying is that we should set up uh, a whole system within Social Security Scotland to pay winter fuel payment for one year, um, because we couldn't pay it for another year because we wouldn't have the money, we'd essentially be just be putting the problem down the road and to set tens of millions of pounds of uh, setting up a whole system within Social Security Scotland to pay uh, one year of winter fuel payment on a universal basis uh, without having any certainty or awareness of where the money is going to come from and having to pay that block grant adjustment back. Um, in future years just strikes me as being very, very um, um, imprudent and not something that we, I, as a finance secretary, could possibly agree to doing 
Um, people need to know, well, first of all, you would be staffing up a section of Social Security Scotland without any certainty of that being able to continue, and you would have no means or knowledge of where the funding was coming from in future years. So I think that would be the worst of all. Sorry, uh, can I just, again, can I clarify? Uh, I mean, had, had the UK government not made this decision, who was going to pay that full amount to... To it. How, well, was it, how was that going to be administered? We would get the £160 million, mm -hmm. and it was going to be administered through Social Security Scotland, but that funding was coming on a, an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. The funding is not coming on an ongoing basis. So uh, if we were to defer the block grant adjustment for a year and pay the benefit for one year, we'd have to set up a whole system to pay that benefit on a universal basis with absolutely no chance of it continuing. And, that, and you hadn't prepared to do that? So, so well, We were in the preparation of doing that. Social Security Scotland was, uh, was recruiting staff. It was ready to... Um, uh, you know, yeah, money had been spent within Social Security Scotland on this already, but it was about to staff up. All the programmes were being worked on, ready for this to be delivered for this winter. So all of that was, was happening. And of course, when the announcement was made and with no consultation, we had to stop that dead in its tracks. Um, so so the, the work was ongoing. It would have been delivered this winter. Um, and the work was going on at pace to do that. So money's already been spent, staff have already been taken on? No, maybe not, not to the extent that there was, the groundwork had been done, but the big uplift in the Social Security Scotland's infrastructure, uh, we, um, the big spend uh, has, has not been made, uh, thankfully, and we were able to stop that in its tracks. What you're suggesting is that we should go ahead and do that, and well, I'm simply asking questions year? about what has been done and what uh, what options you've you've looked at because I mean you've made very clear which, which uh, to this committee and publicly that hands were tied there's nothing you do mm -hmm. which, which uh, I accept there's a fiscal impact because you, the money mm -hmm. would have to be paid back I'm just trying to get an idea of what has been done I mean you're suggesting that um, when the UK government made this decision all this work stopped but you would have been ready to deliver this. To deliver this benefit. If we had, if the if things had continued and it was the money was going to come with the power, so the power has come, but mm -hmm. not the money. But if the power and the money were, was coming as we had planned for, we would be delivering uh, the winter fuel payment on a universal basis from Scotland this winter. But the fact that it was <coughs> not, we had to put, we had to stop. And Social Security stop the work, stop the recruitment, um, because we can't possibly set up a system and um, you know delay the the block grant adjustment for a year, set up that whole system, pay people for one year, and then say, oh, but well. So what were the estimate of costs on that out of it, and what's been spent already? Well, we can get that for you. I mean, we can find out from. I think that's probably already been um, discussed, but we can get. From Social Security Scotland, what costs were, but I mean, you know, we, the, it was not our fault that, you know, there was nothing we could do about that. We had to, we were proceeding in good faith on mm -hmm. the basis of what we thought was going to no, happen. I, I recognise that. I'm just interested but, in but, well, we what costs are being spent because, you know, obviously, if a majority of the the costs of doing this had been spent, it makes that that decision to to pull back a different decision. I mean, you've said you haven't ruled out deferring the full, the, the the block grant uh, mm -hmm. adjustment for the full amount. So if that's the case, and you're not going to deliver winter fuel payments other than means tested, are you suggesting that money is going to be utilised in other parts of the budget? Well, it would just be about whether or not we, um, the, whether or not the the impact of the 160 million, uh, uh, which year that essentially lands in. So we would just be deferring. The, the, the removal of that for a year. Um, so the money's coming out of the system uh, one way or another, and, it's our, and part of the discussion with Treasury is about um, whether there's any discretion about which year that, that comes out of. Uh, Jenny, I don't know. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Maybe only to add that there's a range of moving parts in both the 24-25 financial position, as you'll see through the autumn budget revision and the fiscal framework outturn report. There's still some provisional reconciliations to be applied um, into the 25-26 budget. So both those positions uh, have quite a number of moving parts. 
they won't have settled. As you know, things keep moving even during a financial year. But at the time of budget, the Cabinet Secretary will need to take a range of decisions at that point. Um, other decisions around, for example, the borrowing levels we talked about um, earlier can be taken a little later, normally into, into February. So, so this will be part of that set of decisions around looking across a multi-year estimated funding positions and taking a decision about in the round um, which year would it be most appropriate and most effective for the government to take the block grant adjustment for the winter fuel payment. See, the terminology used there is the kind of terminology that is used very often when we're trying to, we're trying to look at um, how money is being spent. But, I mean, let's just be clear. If the Scottish Government requests a block grant deferral for the full, 100, say, £160 million, and isn't delivering a non-means-tested winter fuel payments, that money is being taken this year, albeit to be paid back, but is being spent in other parts of the budget budget as part so being spent as, in other terms of the reconciliation. Budget. So the reconciliation of the money either happens this year or next year. Um, and it's just, you know, so there's no, there's no, there's no gain. Um, the money is going to, uh, it's just which year it's, it's being used. It's being used to cover spending well, support, in other parts of the budget, not on the winter fuel payments that it was intended. Well, it's just part, it'd be part of the budget. Um, it, it supports the budget and whether it's uh, reconciled this year or next year, um, but know, it's, it's, not, it's not being spent on what it was intended to. Now that's a political decision, and that's a decision the government's well, made. But let's but be clear: it is being spent on it's being spent on spending well, that isn't it's what it was spent, It's being lost to well, the budget. Been, yeah. being so it's which year budget. it's lost to the budget and which year it's reconciled. So is it lost to the budget this year, or is it lost to the budget next year? That that's the question. Um, it's not plus twice next year if you get because it's an ongoing 160 million. Every it year, is, is it not? yeah, yeah. So I, and, and I go back to the point year. about you know we couldn't possibly deploy that and setting up a system that you know would be for a one-year payment. That just wouldn't be right. So it's it's which year is the money lost uh, to the budget? Is it lost this year or is it lost uh, ne next year? It's a, a, a really a, t a technical point of of reconciliation more than anything. But. OK. John. Uh, thanks uh, very much, convener. Um, if I can, first of all, pick up on a couple of points that have been made already. Uh, Liz Smith was talking a lot about competitiveness mm -hmm. of this tax strategy. But I just wonder, is it possible, when we're talking about competitiveness, you know, can we look at tax on its own, or do we also have to look at the spending side, the, the, what that tax enables us to do, like free university uh, tuition fees, no prescription charge, uh, bus passes, etc., etc. Because I mean, presumably we're also competing with countries like Denmark, which mm -hmm. have higher tax and better public services. Yeah, um, I mean the tax spend uh, balance and what the what the overall looks like uh, is important um, on both sides of the equation. Um, and you know our. So our, on the tax side, it, it does um, explicitly s support those who are lower paid, um, and we think that's that's a good thing. Um, but on, on the spend side, it also provides um, it supports a social contract that's not available anywhere else. So whether it's on uh, free tuition or the other supports that are in place, Scottish Child Payment and Anti-Poverty Measure, which you could look at as a, a kind of public good, a public investment that helps the next generation out of poverty and therefore helps society. Um, you know, all of these things are, are about you know, what kind of society is it that we're trying uh, to create here. Um, and I think those um, social provisions are are an important part of that and you know interestingly uh, around you know, what why do people uh, come to scotland um, some of it will be around you know the, the job of a lifetime some of it will be about lower house prices some of it might be around you know relatively lower council tax some of it will be around free tuition and social provision that they that that is a, a, is attractive so you know people will um, make these life-changing decisions based on a whole range of factors. Um, and I think 
in the round, these things that are only available in Scotland are, um, are, are, are attractive to, to many people. Thanks very much. Uh, another subject was touched on earlier was council tax uh, with Ross Greer. Mm. And I, I take your point that you don't want to make a change too dramatically, but would you accept that it has tended to be people in the poorer areas who have lost out because their houses have gone up in value by less, mm -hmm. and people in the richer areas, their houses have gone up by more. So a revaluation would hit the richer and help the poorer? So there is a point uh, about um, how uh, uh, yeah, the valuation uh, has, I think the evidence shows, benefited those in the, the higher uh, bands. There's also a lot of evidence that people in lower incomes pay a higher proportion of their income to council tax and those in... Um, higher bands. Um, one of the reasons we looked at the multiplier issue was to try and address some of that, but of course we, uh, uh, that became highly politically contentious um, uh, and uh, therefore um, we decided not, not to pursue it uh, at that point. So I think you know, moving forward, well, what do we do? We have to try and take people with us and I think uh, we look at the Welsh experience of a, a big bang on revaluation and the difficulties and the challenges that presented. Um, there's always winners and losers, obviously. Um, so I think trying to construct a, a way of doing it that has public buy-in, that's gradual, that's not a kind of cliff edge, that's not a big bang, that is um, reasonable and fair, I think is where we would want to, to get to. Now, that's going to take many years. Uh, to achieve if it's done over a, uh, a much slower time frame. But I think it will avoid um, some of the, that contentious um, and, you know, that, and d difficulty that you know, emerged in the Welsh experience. And I would hope that if it's done on a, a long-term basis, perhaps at the point of house sale, etc., that it would be something that had some political consensus about it. Because continuing for another 30 years uh, uh, you know, with no change at all, I, I don't. I think every financial commentator and, and institution has said, you know, it's just not a sustainable position. So I'm sure, given we're all sensible, we would want to uh, land in a, a sensible a way of proceeding. Okay, thank you. On another subject, we've mentioned capital debt already. Um, now I understand that by the end of 25-26, we will have our debt will be about 2.7 billion, mm -hmm. which is approaching the kind of upper limit that we have. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be a problem? Well, it goes back to the point that I made earlier about us having a bit of self-regulation. I'm going to write to the committee with a little bit of the detail of you know our assumptions there, but. You know, we have our sort of internal rules around what our assumptions are, and you know we have the three billion uh, limit. Obviously, um, we so the fiscal framework uh, adjustments have been helpful in terms of inflation um, proofing uh, those uh, uh, um, elements within the framework. Um, but you know, we we want to we want to make sure that um, anything we are doing in terms of uh, capital debt is within what we deem to be prudent and affordable. Okay. And um, I don't know what Ross Greer was going to ask you, but um, on the National Performance Framework, can you tell us how the National Performance Framework impacts on the budget? So the National Performance Framework uh, is uh, an important part of the budget process in making sure that we can uh, look at our performance around our key delivery areas and where uh, things are going well. So the RAG rated, and we have a, I think a monthly session, if I'm remembering rightly, where we will dive into areas of the National Performance Framework to look at particularly those uh, areas that are RAG-rated red or amber. And therefore, the read across to the budget is, well, what does that tell us about delivery in that area? Does it, is it a funding issue? It's not always a funding issue. Some of it might just be a, around, you know, um, delivery issues um, that are not necessarily tied to, to funding per se um, and trying to, to work through and, and uh, um, you know, get some acceleration of, of delivery in those areas. So, um, but 
the, the budget clearly is an important point to um, just assess whether the um, you know the, the rag rate and the NPF and any adjustments that we need mm -hmm. to make. So it has. I can understand it has a kind of general impact. Mm -hmm. Um, but say when, when you've got limited capital spending and you're having to make mm -hmm. choices and prioritise, uh, say, between housing and roads, then um, would the national performance framework have an impact there? Um, it will have an impact, but so will the programme for government and the clear priorities that are set out. You know, it, it, not everything can be a priority, and there are, I guess, the programme for government was an attempt to lift out the things that, in amongst everything else, were the key things that have to come first. So those um, key strategic objectives um, that um, are the, the guiding point um, for what um, is the, is, is, receives priority within the budget hierarchy. Um, programme for government has um, you know, essentially lifted um, those key um, strategic objectives. Um, and when you're looking at prioritisation and deprioritisation, as inevitably um, you have to do in uh, budgets, then those are the guides that... But you would expect the national performance framework to be very closely aligned to those programme for government objectives. And if they weren't, there's a bit of, bit of an issue there. Um, I mean, we are going into this later with Kate Forbes, I think. But uh -huh. uh, yes, there would be an issue there. I mean, the, the, the programme for government did not refer to the national performance framework, I don't think. I think Ms. Riley assumed really that you know there is an alignment there around the objectives. And uh, I think the programme for government was saying that it's not that everything that's gone before is, is not important. It was elevating things that are absolutely critical importance and that those will come first and foremost in that budget discussion. Right, thanks, Camille. Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, because time is against us and you have another meeting, uh, I won't revisit CAPTA. I'll talk about public sector reform or digitalisation, all of which I hope to cover. But, um, but Jamie has um, uh, provoked uh, me into asking a question, just one final question on another issue, which is about mitigation mm. of UK Westminster welfare cuts. So, for example, the Scottish Government is currently paying £133.7 million mm. pounds to mitigate welfare cuts, the imposition of the bedroom tax being the most obvious. Um, and the Scottish Government's obviously decided it's not going to continue down this road in terms of the winter fuel payment because that £160 million pounds would have to be found from the NHS, local government justice or other budgets. So is the Scottish Government taking a decision, uh, in effect, that we will no longer, they will no longer mitigate any um, reductions in Westminster? Spend, or are they going to continue to look at that on a case by case basis? Yeah. Because obviously, it me that 133.7 million that we're mitigating is also 133.7 million. It's not going to devolve areas of spend. So, very much on a case by case. Um, I mean, we we wouldn't take you know as blunt a tool as saying, um, but not not least that many of the mitigations are you know helping people remain in their homes. So, in terms of mitigating the bedroom tax, people are literally only able to stay in their home because of those dis discretionary housing payments that are being made. Uh, through local authorities. Now, there is a very important point, though, in the point you're making, and that is if, it was, um, if the bedroom tax was scrapped at source, then that would immediately give a, a, a benefit to uh, the Scottish budget in being able to deploy the £133 million, um, that we uh, support uh, discretionary housing payments and, indeed, the Scottish Welfare Fund is mitigating um, many aspects of the UK uh, welfare system um, and so on and so forth. So there is a point here that the more that can be addressed at source, the more we are able then to utilise those resources for, for other uh, important pressing issues. So. <clears throat> but I wouldn't want to leave anyone any doubt. We're not, certainly not going to be removing discretionary housing payments. Um, but the point is one that we raise with the UK government um, at every opportunity of the need for them to, to, to take a look at all of these things. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, just <coughs> before we wind up, are there any final points you want to make to <coughs> committee? No, I, I, I look to forward to further engagement um, with the committee on the, the budget as we go forward. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to the Cabinet Secretary and our officials for appearing today. That concludes our evidence taking on managing Scotland's public finances, a strategic approach. We'll consider all the evidence received as part of our inquiry and publish a report in early November. We'll now take a short break to allow for a change of our witnesses before we move to our next agenda item at uh, 20 past 11.
Item on our agenda is our final evidence session on the Scottish Government's proposed national outcomes, which forms part of the National Performance Framework. I welcome to the meeting of the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Gaelic, Kate Forbes, MSP, who is joining us remotely from Shetland. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Scottish Government officials, Keith MacDonald, Unit Head, Strategy Division, and Katie Allison, Analytical Unit Head, Central Analysis Division. I welcome you all to the meeting and invite the Deputy First Minister to make a short opening statement. Kate. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Uh, delighted to be with you on quite a stormy day in Shetland. So uh, here's uh, here's hoping I get I get home at some point this week. Um, it's uh, very good of you to allow me to uh, join in this flexible way. And there's sort of a bit of deja vu from from COVID. So to the National uh, Performance Framework, as the committee will know, in 2007, the National Performance Framework, the NPF. Um, was introduced and since then it's evolved into a well-being framework with shared national outcomes for all of Scotland. And when I look at the national outcomes, I think the best way to sum it up is that it paints a picture of the kind of Scotland that we hopefully all aspire to be. I know that some of the stakeholder views submitted to the inquiry suggest that we can improve and lead a stronger, more impactful framework. I'm quite encouraged by that kind of feedback because it demonstrates the MPF's value as a means for all of Scotland's actors, agencies to debate and to challenge the collective progress that we're making as a nation. We all have a role in helping to deliver the national outcomes because the MPF belongs to the whole of Scotland, so it isn't just owned by government. Our review, which I know you will be scrutinising today, has proposed changes. That includes the introduction of new outcomes on care and climate change and housing. And it was good to see the SPICE analysis of the inquiry's call for views, which said that the responses reflect strong support for the proposed outcomes of the NPF with recommendations to enhance the effectiveness and inclusivity. Overall, the review is proposing an increase in the number of national outcomes from 11 to 13. I appreciate that the inquiry has heard that fewer outcomes, such as in the Welsh Government's approach, would lead to greater impact, alignment and so on. And it would be good to perhaps discuss that uh, over the course of this morning. We've also proposed that the purpose of the MPF is updated to, and I quote, improving the well-being of people living in Scotland now and in the future. The SPICE analysis was again encouraging because it said that that change had garnered significant uh, support and it represents a mainstreamed purpose. I can assure the committee that the wellbeing economy, part of the wording of the current purpose, is a priority for uh, the government and will continue to be guided by the national outcomes in this area. We've also confirmed that we will consult and collaborate with stakeholders and partners on our plans for improved implementation and guidance to ensure that the MPF is consistently and effectively applied right across Scotland. That was recommended by your committee in 2022, and I note that evidence to the inquiry further supports this. We'll also include a refreshed set of national indicators, which will be launched alongside the new national outcomes in 2025. The national outcomes seek to promote equality. The evidence gathered throughout the government's review was used to better understand the interests of equality groups, and those have been reflected in the proposals. And it's important that the inquiry is looking at that area. I consider the MPF to be a really important part of how we do government. So it helps us work together as a nation, helps us to achieve our national outcomes, to improve the quality of life for the people of Scotland. It is used within government, but in my role as a Deputy First Minister, I'll be looking to ensure that it is being done well so that we can demonstrate the leadership, the stewardship and the facilitation role that is expected of us in government. I know you've also heard disappointment regarding the implicit rather than the explicit inclusion of the national outcomes in the recently pro published programme for government. I can assure you that the First Minister's four priorities are very closely aligned uh, with the national outcomes and guided by the national outcomes. And I suppose I would uh, challenge anyone to uh, see a way in which the four priorities aren't backed up by uh, the national uh, outcomes. I would agree that we need to have a visible leadership role uh, in ensuring that the MPF is adopted across Scotland. 
As the committee may know, we will not be introducing a wellbeing and sustainable development bill at this time. We have committed to work across the chamber with Sarah Boyack on her members' bill as proposals develop, and I'm due to meet her uh, this week on the 9th of October so that we can discuss how we uh, work together. As I close, um, progress towards the national outcomes is, of course, a proxy for progress towards the sustainable development goals because of the close alignment between them. The NPF and the SDGs capture the ambition of creating a better world and also recognise up front the challenges that are involved in doing that. They set the deadline for a specific set of local and global improvements for 2030. And I want us by that point to tell a good story about Scotland's contribution and experience when we reach that milestone. So uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. Thanks to uh, the committee and thanks to all the stakeholders who have submitted their views to our statutory review and to your committee's inquiry. And obviously very happy to answer your questions today. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Deputy First Minister. I appreciate your uh, opening statement. I think um, if we go back to the beginning of this process uh, with regard to the Scottish Government's consultation, there was a um, concern raised by a number of our witnesses, as you'll be aware, that this wasn't ambitious enough and that the awareness of the NPF has diminished because of the lack of ambition in the consultation. And some of the witnesses took the view that um, if the consultation process is weak, then it, it essentially, you know, it, it's not being given the priority within government that it should have. And in fact, across a lot of the evidence we took, that seems to be the case. Way back in 2007, this seemed to be almost revolutionary and quite dynamic in Scotland. And it seems to have lost a bit of its importance as, uh, as far as um, the perceptions of it go. So, um, it wasn't mentioned, as, as John Mason uh, pointed out, to the Finance Secretary at the programme for government. And so one wonders just how, um, how much uh, the framework actually underpins uh, government activity. So uh, let me answer that in, in two parts. So the way in which it underpins the government's activity and then the point around the consultation. Um, I get very nervous when we fixate on uh, the visibility of something to the detriment of how embedded it actually is in changing things. So you're right that when the NPF was first uh, launched, it, there would have been uh, much excitement, as there is with anything that's new. And there is a great danger and tendency amongst politicians to look for the next new thing Whereas actually, if you work hard at delivering what you've already said you're going to deliver, you're more likely to deliver change. And so I would, I would be very reluctant to take on board any criticism that was, we need to be doing more new things rather than actually where we started in 2007, committing to deliver what uh, was essentially uh, aligned with the sustainable uh, development goals. And, I think we should be pushed harder on how much progress we've made against the commitments made in 2007, rather than in 2024, trying to come up with new uh, shiny things, which may distract from the original delivery. Saying that it should be about new things, I think what people are saying is that they, they're concerned that the, the Scottish Government is paying lip service to the National Performance Framework and that it's not embedded in what the Government does, that it's not clear, for example, how Government uh, spending uh, aligns with it or indeed Government priorities align with it. Um, you know, it's the fact that the consultation was not um, all singing, all dancing, as, it, as many of the witnesses said it should have been, but was fairly limited in scope, um, made them think, well, the Scottish Government isn't really serious about this. It's something, it's almost a tick box exercise. So I think that's a real major criticism uh, of where we are at, at this time. And, it, and there was a, an expression of disappointment among many people who are themselves committed to the national problems very much that they feel the government is not as committed as perhaps some of our stakeholders are. And I think that's, you know, I, I, let me take on board the, the first half in terms of how committed we are. So let me come on to that. But just to challenge that point again about the fact that the consultation should have been broader, in other words, doing more things. That's what sits uncomfortably with me. I think we should have a streamlined approach that is really focused and which is ultimately much easier to embed 
and much easier uh, to measure. Um, and in terms of the proposed revised revisions that we've made, they do uh, enable us to streamline and focus the work that we uh, are doing. On the consultation itself, um, you know, we, we have made changes where there was a strong evidence base of uh, the need for change. So where we've introduced new outcomes, which you'll know, new outcomes on care, new outcomes on housing, new outcomes on climate, they were uh, areas where we had significant support to make changes. Um, on the flip side, there were stakeholders that have cautioned against increasing the total number of outcomes. Um, and that is goes back to my point around having a streamlined and focused uh, approach. Um, you did ask at the beginning about the extent to which it's embedded in government. And at the end of the day, in any sort of political cycles, uh, there will always be uh, pressure to lift our eyes off the outcomes that we have set out in the National Performance Framework in the, the, the sort of tidal waves of politics coming and going. What I've seen during my time in government is an increasing awareness of the National Performance Framework and increasing desire to align the policy work we do with the National Performance Framework. So that was most visible in finance. It was most visible when it comes to uh, the budget. I think it allowed for very uh, stark conversations about where some of the National Performance Framework outcomes clash with one another, because they do. Uh, at times they do, and at times government and indeed parliament has to make a conscious choice about what it is going to um, what it is going to to focus on, and and sometimes you see that I just talked about two new uh, outcomes on housing and climate. So uh, being in, in in Shetland, if I could use this example, they told me yesterday they have a choice to make: do they decarbonise the houses that they already have with the money they have, or do they build more houses? So let's not pretend that uh, all of these decisions are easy, and let's not pretend either that when it comes to embedding all the national performance framework in the policy work that we do, that there aren't still further questions to answer, because I don't think anyone would disagree with the picture that we are painting with all the national performance framework. All of us would like to live in a Scotland where all of those outcomes are met, yes. But the business of government requires us to start with those outcomes and then figure out the most effective way of delivering them through policy. I mean, you talked about the importance of it, um, for example, with regard to the framework with regard to finance, but the, the national reforms framework is not seen as explicitly or transparently driving financial decisions by the government, nor holding organisations to account um, for, the, for spending funding effectively. Well, if I can, you know, no longer being finance secretary, perhaps I could talk about my own uh, portfolio area of, of economy, right? So um, when it comes to the economy work that we do, all of it goes back to the national performance framework. Uh, in terms of the decisions that we make, um, that is quite clearly uh, and starkly included in the decision making um, that we that we go through. So the, the, the First Minister has essentially picked four top priorities, one of which is, is economic growth. Uh, but that has to be done in the in the spirit of the well-being economy. That is not just pursuing economic group growth to the neglect of all the other outcomes. And, and that is quite visible in the decisions that we are making. Take one of the bills that's included in the national performance or in the program for government this year, community wealth building. The point is that we are not just pursuing economic growth and economic prosperity as an end in itself. It all has to um, be part of delivering the national performance framework outcomes, including the sustainability point in terms of the environment, uh, in terms of delivering more housing, uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, uh, communities uh, and so on and their health and well-being. Um, so there's an example where it is embedded in the economy work uh, that we do. Oh, OK, but economic growth is obviously important if we're going to provide the resources to do all that we wish to do eh, 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 as a parliament and indeed you do as a government. Um, but there are concerns regarding the omission of explicit references to eh, economic eh, growth. Um, so, for example, this, um, this uh, makes, for example, Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce, who gave evidence to say that this feels as if economic growth is being downgraded by the government, which is exactly the opposite of the message that we want to convey, given it's one of the four priorities that you've already touched on. 
Um, economic growth, to my mind, is a uh, means. Uh, it's not an end in itself. So the end is the outcomes that are captured in the National Performance Framework. So where we um, have economic growth, to my mind, it is about making Scotland more prosperous, making Scotland fairer. It's a means of delivering against our environmental ambitions. It is a means to an end. And I think uh, where I would be reluctant to embed it as a, a national outcome in and of itself is that it confuses means and ends. Uh, we do not celebrate economic growth uh, as an end in itself. I want to live in communities where there is a, where there is fairness, where everybody is paid a fair wage, where you don't have fuel poverty, where you have better health uh, outcomes, and so on. I could go through the whole list, but I won't. And that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are all about. Uh, they are about ensuring that there is fairness and equality across the board. I would far rather that fairness and equality was at a high level in terms of people's incomes, and that is where we, we need more economic growth. But it is not an end in itself. It is a means to the ends that are captured in the National Performance Framework. OK, although they've suggested that, and I quote, losing the focus on something is a critical uh, enabler of um, people's well-being is a risk. And to go on to well-being, you've touched on well-being on, on a number of occasions. Um, many witnesses in terms of consultation suggested that the framework should be changed from something somewhat less tedious and boring than national performance framework to Scotland's well-being framework, for example, even ambitions for Scotland, something a bit more dynamic. Now, I know that the national performance framework is something that's been the title since 2007. It's hardly caught fire with the public. It's very similar, in fact, to the national planning framework in terms of the, even the acronym. So, um, what, the same acronym. So, so why, have, why has the government decided not to actually call it um, Scotland's well-being framework, seen as that is clearly the direction of travel from almost everything you've said this morning so far? So, the general theme of all my comments this morning is that I'm not minded to make changes for their own sake. I will make changes that mean we are better at delivering the outcomes, but to my mind, uh, changing names uh, doesn't actually help anybody. And therefore, uh, changing the name as has been uh, requested, it would not be one of my uh, top priorities. Um, we have got a strong branding around uh, the framework that has been built up since 2007. It is a key part of some of our international work. You know, the engagement that we have had with uh, other governments in terms of how we have developed the National Performance Framework and how we use it for policy work, all of that is aligned with the name as it stands. If I thought that changing the name would deliver more fairness to somebody in the country, I'd be more persuaded, but I'm not. OK, thank you very much. Um, now, the, you, talk, you touched also on UN Sustainable Development Goals and they aim to achieve no poverty. But it was unclear whether the national outcome which seeks to reduce poverty is because, as Scotland's NPF, the national outcomes are more realistic about what will be achieved within a devolved setting. Is that the case? Um, could you? I don't quite follow that question. Could you just clarify? Basically, what, what, basically what the, the, the UN is saying in its development goals is their aim is no poverty. But ours is to reduce poverty. And it was just to ask if that's because what the Scottish Government is saying was we can't actually eliminate poverty within a devolved set setting. Um, is, that, is that the reason for it, or is there another reason why you haven't um, taken um, the no poverty? Obviously, this work started back in sort of 2022. I think that was when the um, first initial review work started. Um, the First Minister, uh, as of May, has been very explicit that he seeks to eliminate uh, poverty, eliminate child poverty. Uh, in Scotland. So we are seeking to be uh, as ambitious as possible when it comes to our poverty uh, work. Um, you know, that, that may be actually quite a useful point of feedback from the committee, just around that, that uh, verbalising of eliminate versus uh, reduce, because the First Minister has been very clear about our ambitions to, I think he uses the word, eradicate uh, child uh, poverty. Um, Either way, uh, you know that maybe that's something I'm open to uh, reconsidering. I mean, I myself find it difficult to comprehend how a sub-state legislature could eradicate child poverty or poverty, frankly, with the powers that we've got, which are 
limited, let's be honest about it, and which can be changed at a moment's notice, really, by the UK government. So how realistic are those ambitions in the National Performance Framework? So at the moment, as they stand, and that is the terminology reducing poverty is how it stands right now, the aim is that every agency, every actor in Scotland sees that as one of their priorities. So how they do their work must deliver a reduction in poverty. And this is where I think the National Performance Framework it really works quite effectively. So again, not to keep using um, examples from um, these wonderful islands of Shetland, but you have a situation here where you've got major energy giants operating you know, quite effectively if your sole purpose is the transition to net zero, so um, uh, the climate, or if your sole purpose is economic prosperity, because it is. But you also have upwards of 30% in fuel poverty. So it's a means by which a local authority or a national government can hold major companies to account and say, in Scotland, we have an ambition of reducing poverty. That is one of our key outcomes. So how you do your work matters just as much as the, the work you're doing in terms of climate and prosperity. And, you know, there's, there's big opportunities to do that. You know, I was quite struck by the fact that uh, a community wind farm has done more in terms of reinvesting and reducing, reducing poverty in these islands than some of the, the major corporations have done. So that's, that would be my point, or maybe perhaps a visible ex example of how it, this has got to be a, a genuinely national uh, piece of work and not just how governments are held to account. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open out the session to colleagues around the table. The first to ask a question will be Ross, before by John. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the, the updates uh, to the framework are perfectly reasonable, but I share the scepticism inherent in the convener's opening question about the extent to which making these changes or, or not will actually change the outcomes that, that we're all looking for here. I was at the University of the West of Scotland uh, last week and they were able to, without, before I'd even asked, evidence how they base their strategic plan uh, around the national performance framework, how they align with that. They were better able to evidence that than the Scottish Government is. And what I am struggling to, to decide myself is the extent to which this is a challenge for the, the government because it's not able to evidence the work it's doing or the, uh, whether it's actually worse than that and the MPF is simply not being taken into account. Do you understand the issue there that if the Scottish government can't actually evidence the, its alignment with its own performance framework when other organisations have taken up this challenge, um, that, that does prevent, uh, present some quite profound questions. Well, I, I, let me answer that in a couple of ways. And then if other officials want to come in, I can speak to uh, how we uh, embed it in, in, in the policy work. But I think what you're talking about is the, the visible measurement and reporting of uh, the work that we do in terms of how to show uh, Parliament um, what we can uh, do. And that has been a key part in, um, in the review process, is what can we do around uh, reporting? So what can we do? So the chief statistician, for example, has been heavily involved in the review um, and how he can uh, support the work, working with the Office of National Statistics, um, and looking at well-being measures uh, and so on to be able to quantify because I can give you lots of qualitative evidence in terms of what we do but I think what you're looking for is quant basically quantifying the, the work what has changed that wouldn't have changed if we hadn't embedded uh, the national uh, performance uh, framework so I don't know if... It, in, sorry. sorry to cut in. Um, it, it's a bit of both. It's exactly what you say there in terms of quantifying evidence, the outcomes, but also to be able to 
evidence that that is the government's intention in the first place. So we had a witness in last week or a couple of weeks ago um, who rhymed off, I think, the last half dozen major strategy documents of the government. So taking aside the PFG for a moment, which I'll come back to, um, he referenced half a dozen um, government strategy documents across a range of portfolios. I, if I'm getting this right, I think maybe four out of the six of them made no reference to the National Performance Framework and the other two made very passing reference, nothing specific about individual outcomes. So do you recognise the, the challenge there? How has it come about that the, the government, which is, as you say, very committed to the National Performance Framework, is pretty consistently publishing high-level, quite significant documents outlining its strategy, but those documents don't reference the MPF? That, that's, a, that's a problem, isn't it? Well, we will, we will definitely take that on board. And again, that goes back to the visibility point, and it goes back to the point I made to the convener at the beginning, which is um, confusing visibility for, for practice. But Parliament needs to be cited on how we're doing things and what we are, are, are doing. So I think this is a key part of our implementation plan. So once, the, once we are all agreed and we've received the committee's report on to whether the substance is right and you know your your feedback on the substance the next uh, next hurdle is implementation and embedding that and as part of that it needs to we need to consider uh, better reporting and accountability so i'm open to discussions on how we embed greater levels of accountability into this whole process so if it's something as simple as every strategy has to illustrate how it aligns with the the national performance framework that is something that we could you know that we could uh, consider if there's other ways of doing it but I, I wonder if any of the officials want to come in and i don't know who to put this to but just on reporting accountability and implementation okay. don't all rush at once i think keith's looking to come in do it for keith to come in Apologies, I was just trying to un unmute there. Thank you. Oh, I think yeah. someone's sitting back on mute. On mute. Hello, on can you hear me now? We can hear you now, Keith, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I was just going to make the point that the, the DFM has just made, actually. I think, I think it's safe to say that you will find the National Performance Framework mentioned across a government published strategy, but I think the point that's coming through here is that that isn't consistent across all, uh, just as the DFM has just said. So um, I know the, in the inquiry will be talking about implementation plan in the minutes, I'm sure, but that is definitely something that we can look at as we look to implement it better next year, just to make sure that MPF is, as, a, as it should be, consistent across all government published policy and strategy. Hope that's helpful. Thanks very much. If I could return to the, the PFG, Cabinet Secretary, you presented a pretty rosy picture. You, you argued that it's uh, implicit rather than explicit, um, and you seem to indicate that that was a, a deliberate choice. Um, you made the point that the First Minister's four priorities um, match the outcomes in, in the MPF, and I would say, uh, of, of course they do. They're all very agreeable. The only reason I could think somebody would have to, to disagree is if they were a climate science denier. But beyond that, it's all extremely agreeable stuff. But it was an omission, right? Like it, it, it's quite a significant omission that the single most important document in government didn't reference the framework the government actually uses to measure whether it's uh, achieving the building the kind of society that it wants but would it not be easier to just come this morning and say look that was a that was an oversight it won't happen again um i could do i suppose i'm reluctant to go down that route because the whole point of the pfg was to be short punchy and clear. And there has been lots of criticism since the PFG was uh, published about the omissions. So particular sectors being omitted, particular strategies being omitted. I think there's been criticism that we didn't explicitly say, for example, that we were going to work the, with the with Sarah Boyack's bill. Um, and by the time you've gone through all those omissions, if you had included them all, um, you lose the short, punchy document. So if there should have been a line at the top saying this government abides by the National Performance Framework, then that you know could have been included. Um, I don't think it would have made any difference to whether or not the government delivers on its 
aims within the programme for government. And I'm very much of the view that the committee should hold me to account for whether or not we are meeting the outcomes rather than whether or not we're using the right language in things like programmes for government. I don't disagree with you at all that the outcomes are what's important here, and that's primarily what government's held to account for. But do you not recognise that there's a leadership role here for government as well? Government doesn't just expect the MPF to be used uh, by it, the government directly and, and public bodies more widely. It expects the whole of society, the whole of the economy, business, etc. The Scottish Government wants everybody to embrace the national performance framework, and therefore the government itself should visibly embrace it, because otherwise it's, it's hard to see how that leadership role is being performed there. I do agree with you on that. And that is one that I, you know, I think I think you are right, that we have a, a visible leadership approach, uh, or we need to have a, a, a visible uh, leadership uh, role when it comes to um, ensuring that the national performance framework is adopted across Scotland. So if I go back to my example of uh, the big energy company, if we're holding them to account and they turn around and say, well, how are you doing it? We need to be able to pretty quickly point to the ways that we are doing it. So you are right on, on that front. And that does require an element of, of, of rhetoric and visibility uh, explicitly in, in, certain, in certain documents. Um, I do think that this is just the big, the big challenge. I, I noticed that Carnegie UK, in their oral evidence uh, to yourselves in September, had said that, one example, aligning budgets with national outcomes is not straightforward, and lots of countries are wrestling with it. I think we're wrestling with it too, in how we um, explicitly link what we choose to do in a very political environment with a document like the National Performance Framework, where nobody disagrees with the outcomes that are outlined in it. And we're all trying to do the work that shifts the dial on those outcomes. Thanks very much. That's all from me, Convener. Thank you. Thank you. John, to be followed by Michelle. Hey, thanks very much, Convener. I mean, maybe to build on the, the previous two questioners. I mean, I, I do wonder, listening to the evidence, um, you know, it does all, the, the national performance framework just seems to be so general, and uh, we're going up from 11 to 13 outcomes. And you yourself have already said that uh, there can be clashes uh, between different outcomes. So I'm wondering if that's part of the problem. I mean, does the national performance framework actually help us in making day to day decisions? And this is what I asked Sean Robinson previously. You know, if we are to have a limited capital budget, we have to choose between roads and houses or anything else. Um, does the national performance framework actually help us make that kind of decision? Or is it just that houses are good, roads are good, so whatever? Yeah. So I think the national perf performance framework is designed to enjoy as much consensus as possible. So if you want it to be an, uh, something that is owned nationally, there has to be, you have to maximise the consensus. So uh, people can't uh, disagree with it, uh, except for, to, to Ross Greer's point, climate deniers, for example. People don't disagree with it. But it is, it sets out the end destination that we want to get to. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a vision that, yes, we want to uh, deliver now uh, and deliver for generations to come. But it sets out the end destination and it cannot replace the political day-to-day -day decision making that's required so for example i know you just had the finance secretary talking about winter fuel payments and the, the choices in and around that we want to reduce poverty but there are a number of different ways to reduce poverty there's a scottish child payment there's building good affordable homes there is uh, to your point around roads for uh, rural areas, actually roads are part of reducing poverty because if, if you can't if you can't get to work or you can't it costs you a fortune uh, to get to um, uh, healthcare, uh, for example, that does exacerbate uh, poverty. You know, uh, fuel bills in rural areas are a massive driver of poverty, and that is linked to transport. So the national performance framework sets out. What we are, it reminds us constantly of what we want Scotland to be. But you still have to take 
the really difficult choices, which sometimes can be can between good and better, not good and bad. Maybe this would be an opportunity too, just to say some of the work that goes on to support the policy officials who give us the advice in the first place, because um, there is training uh, for policy officials on the national performance framework. It is promoted to the policy advisors who are then tasked with the job of giving uh, government ministers advice on what to do or what not to do. The other thing which is more recent is that the First Minister, as of May, has been really clear that he wants a sort of focus on strategy and uh, delivery. And uh, there's been a bit of restructuring going on. And it's the, it's the strategy and delivery directorate, the people that are tasked with making sure we meet our aims, who now own the national uh, performance framework. So all the work they do internally on monitoring uh, delivery and strategy, they have to be cognizant of the national performance framework as the sort of ultimate direction of travel. Okay, that's an interesting word, cognizant, and th there's also a phrase, um, having regard to, and some people have felt that these kind of phrases are too weak and we should really have something a bit stronger. It's also been said that so far it's been more carrot than stick. So should we have a bit more stick and a bit more um, p uh, pressure on people? There's definitely a lot uh, more stick with the work that John Swinney, the First Minister, has done in government uh, within the early months of his tenure. So I talked about restructuring. He has, uh, under his leadership, um, done a lot of reform to the, the, the delivery function. So measuring delivery, making sure that we do what we say we're going to do. And that's why the programme for government was a lot punchier, because it's a lot easier to monitor progress against, a f against fewer hard-hitting actions than it is against lots of nice actions that nobody could disagree with. So the, the reason for the programme for government's tight focus was primarily because he places such weight on monitoring delivery and has tasked a team in government to focus almost entirely on delivery. And they are the same team that own the, the national performance framework. So that rigidity of measuring progress will also be applied to how we are uh, comparing with the ambitions that we've set out in the national performance framework. So if monitoring or measuring progress is important, is it a problem that there are so many organisations and parts of government and the public sector who are responsible for it? Because then does it not make it very difficult to pin down? Is it the government? Is it local government? Is it the NHS? You know, who is it who hasn't delivered or who has delivered for that matter? So I think that is an attention inherent in any document which is owned by all of Scotland. So if there, there's no way that um, only government can achieve any of the national performance frameworks, uh, that would only perhaps be the case in, a, in, in something that wasn't a democracy. In a democracy, there is agency and responsibility on lots of different public sector organisations, but also we always seem to forget the private sector organisations as well. So I'll give you one small example. The more that fair work is embedded in private sector organisations, the more likely it is that people are paid a fair wage and that their well-being is considered, the more likely it is that you reduce poverty. But that is a responsibility on, on the private sector. So inherent in a document like this that is owned so widely, there will be tensions, and which is why I think you know, I, I'm open to the committee's views on accountability and implementation. But if there's too narrow of an approach taken that doesn't hold all of Scotland 
responsible for achieving these aims, then we may miss the point in this being a national document. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, convener. Sorry, um, Michelle, to follow by Michael. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Convener. Just a, a quick observation that I, I'm not asking as a question. In terms of the consultation, it, the concerns raised weren't about doing more things. It was about the way in which the, the exercise was carried out as a research piece that brought criticism and led to the belief that it was a tick box exercise. I wanted to pick up on the Convener's comment about <coughs> economic... Uh, growth, and I, I've heard the Cabinet Secretary's responses therein. But I suppose I would add the additional concern. It's my perception that the last few years have seen uh, a, a lack of uh, a, a clear look at long-term thinking. For example, our budget scrutiny this year is called a strategic approach. Uh, we've heard often the issues with the lack of multi-year funding, growing and increasing the tax base to, to fund things. These are all long-term endeavours that require a resilient economy. So, to me, it wasn't just dropping uh, inclusive, uh, or sorry, sustainable, uh, inclusive economic growth, focusing for a minute on the sustainable economic growth. So I'd appreciate some comments on that as well, just not as, as the Cabinet Secretary says, economic growth for its own sake. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I, I'm assuming, stop me if I've got this wrong, but I'm assuming that specifically references the creation of the wellbeing economy and fair work outcome, but also the overarching purpose of the National Performance Framework. Yes. Those are the two areas where there has been a change in, in wording. So um, there are obviously reasons for uh, the changes. If I could go through both changes and then maybe uh, summarise what we could do next. So the creation of the wellbeing economy and fair work outcome brought together the previous economy and fair work and business outcomes. So it tried to, to streamline the outcomes. It was trying to capture the fact that these are very interconnected. So Again, the spirit of not having multiple different uh, competing outcomes, bringing them together. Um, the, you know, the, the, as Spice had suggested that, you know, bringing it together created a more balanced and inclusive approach to, to economic uh, development. Um, but how we were the national performance framework is important. I do think my point around economic uh, growth being a means to an end is also important. In terms of the overarching, so those were the reasons given for that. In terms of the overarching purpose, um, the reason for um, the change in uh, the purpose was again to try and bring it up to date. So we, uh, the last one I think was quite unwieldy. I don't know what the committee thinks, but I think it was quite unwieldy, if I recall, to focus on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased wellbeing and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And we've updated it to improve the wellbeing of Scotland living in, to prove, improve the wellbeing of people living in Scotland now and in the future. It just, it just feels a lot uh, tighter, a lot cleaner. Um, but if there is sufficient concern about the absence of any explicit reference to economic growth. You know, again, there's an openness. I, I'm very open to what the committee's report states. So, you know, the committee's report is going to be very important. We will take it on board. If the committee think that this is a sufficiently concerning change, then uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm open to that. I would just be reluctant to ignore the fact that economic growth is a means to an end. And if you achieve it as an end, whilst neglecting everything else it's designed to achieve, I think you have, have failed to actually get the spirit and the letter of the UN Sustainable Goals. And I think that last point yeah, you make very clearly and indeed previously. Just to finish off this conversation, in terms of occlusive, I noticed that the... Uh, the equality impact assessment that's already been produced, it, it calls for a more consideration of a more gendered national performance framework. And the official line from the Scottish Government at the moment, it says it proposes to mainstream gender more effectively, but it's not yet possible 
to take an intersectional approach. I'd like your comments on that, but that, for me, f feeds into some of my concerns about inclusive economic growth, because we know women in particular, in terms of having a top seat at every level of the economic table, continues to be an issue. So I'd like your reflections on the EIA uh, and where we are at with addressing some of the issues. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. No, and that has come through. Now, if, if any um, officials want to come in, and just on on the background, I'm very conscious that a lot of the consultation work happened before I was in office. So perhaps some of the the conversations that happened uh, during that period, um, I'm not as as close to. So if any officials want to come in, uh, please uh, do on the main streaming. But I am conscious that a number of stakeholders have recommended that. Um, equalities and human rights be more explicitly integrated in national accounts with a particular focus on intersectionality and uh, gender uh, mainstreaming. So you know, we have taken a far more um, explicit focus on, on gender so that the care um, outcome was uh, very much because of the fact that uh, we know that, that more women are uh, involved in the business of, of, of delivering uh, care. Um, we have accepted the National Advisory Council on Women and Girls recommendation to carry out a thematic gender review of the national performance uh, framework. So um, those themes that came through uh, were basically reflected in the, the proposed revisions uh, to uh, the outcomes. So there's been a lot of work to try and ensure that there is a more gendered approach to the national performance framework. But I wonder if officials wanted to answer that point specifically on mainstreaming, which will always be a tension on explicit outcomes versus mainstreaming. Keith, do you want to come back in? Michelle. Sorry. Yeah, it was just to say before your officials come in, just to to build on that point, the, the root of it is still data collectors where we've not routinely got disaggregated data being collected. Indeed, in gender noted the lack of disaggregated data in responses to the consultation. So I suppose uh, when your officials come in or final comments from yourself, I'm also interested in where we're at fundamentally to make that you, the all data is representative and can be sliced and diced as appropriate, because I realise it is, it's not always a possible wherever, wherever we can, because we're still not yet at the point where this is routinely done. Keith wants to come in here, actually. Uh, Deputy First Minister. Keith. Hello. <laughs> Earth calling Keith. <laughs> Sorry, we've got no sign Major of uh, Keith here Sorry. to come in. Oh. Sorry, it's my, um, it's my colleague Katie who's just, just trying to come in. Uh, we do apologise because we're joining by browser. When we try to unmute, there's a very long delay. So I don't know. If no problem. You're, you're managing to. Well, whilst Katie's trying to unmute, because you talk about the data point specifically, uh, I think just a, ge a general point in that, echoing what the DFM said, that we have conducted a call to impact assessments and they've been laid out and um, and they're re represented through our updated proposals. Um, we, we will need to return uh, to the call to impact assessment at a level pending um, the recommendations of the of this inquiry uh, to support the refresh set um, next year. That's just a kind of technical detail if that's helpful. But I'll see if Katie wants to press the button again. Apologies for this. There we go. I think that should be working. I think um, I was unmuted, but unfortunately, Keith is sitting across the table for me, so it was interrupting with that. So, uh, yeah, it's just worth me saying that we will, um, the Deputy First Minister mentioned the thematic gender review. So just to say that we'll publish the thematic or gender review on the National Performance Framework website for the consideration within the parliamentary review. Um, we're also talked about um, data quality. So, uh, as you'll probably be aware, the MPF does not collect data directly, so rather it utilises data collections, surveys and administrative data from across the Scottish Government. So this is to take advantage of the rich data that Scotland already has to offer and reduce respondent burden across Scotland by using the existing data um, and be financially mindful, not creating additional resource and projects costs where these are not lead, uh, needed. So this can lead to data gaps in the indicator set where there's no suitable data currently available. 
But as we kind of see it, the presence of a data gap in the MPF can be used as a driver for change to evidence the need for commissioned analysis to fill the gap. So should new and relevant data collections be developed in the coming years, and we consider it for the conclusion in the next review. So hopefully that answers your question, but happy to come in on it again. Yeah, uh, I mean, it sounds like a, a very stock and sensible approach you're adopting, and I'm merely making the point to finish off that it needs a very strong driving wind, otherwise that stated position will never really change because that's what the evidence has told us over a period of years. Just my last question, so when will the thematic gender review be published and what date? We don't have a set date, but it will be before the, the end of the parliamentary review, we expect in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Michael, to be followed by Liz. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Good morning, Deputy First Minister. Or sorry, good afternoon. Uh, the, the evidence that we've received uh, so far as a committee on this seemed, I think, indicated that many of the stakeholders see the national performance framework as a way of trying to break the short-term cycle of politics to try and have a longer-term view. Um, do you think it helps in that regard? Great question. Could I suggest that I also think they want it to break down silos as well? That seems to be the two themes that come through. Break the short-term cycle and break down the silos, so we have a, a broader view. Um, I think that it, when it comes to the work of governing, there is the, the political representation of the administration but there is the constancy of the civil service and the advice that comes to ministers. And it is my impression that the national performance framework is well understood by the civil service. There is training provided on it and it is uppermost in the minds of uh, advisors. So when it comes to the advice that is given to ministers, the national performance framework is pretty visible then you hold us to account as to whether or not ministers make the decisions that actually deliver change in the national performance framework. So in the very narrow question you asked, does the national performance framework outlast political cycles? My view is that it does, because it is based on the sustainable goals of the United Nations, which itself is a much bigger institution, I think a better respected institution than anything that we might do. Let, let me be slightly more narrow then, narrower, um, on, on the basis of does it actually work? I mean, we have a situation, you know, last October, in reaction to the Rutherglen by election, we had a council tax freeze um, in, within days that, that was announced. We've had three years of emergency budgets um, in, in, in a row with um, major adjustments to, to public spending. Um, and we have a plethora of reports that say that we've had in front of this committee saying that actually the government does not take long-term decisions about, for instance, particularly around public finances and public service reform. So are, are these the right questions to be governing these key issues? So the objectives that are set in this, are, are, are they giving us help with those core issues of making long-term decisions? Because it doesn't appear to be. So you can't confuse political manifestos and the national performance framework. And, you know, as uh, this is not a political point, it's a, just a very genuine point, as parties find when they get into government that in opposition, it's easy to have a big overarching aim that we all agree on, which is reducing poverty. You get into office and then you're tasked with the how you actually do that. And there's a, there's a, there's a multitude yeah. of different means for doing it. That's where the political choices come in. And some some things will work and some things won't work. In terms of the um in terms of the sort of the, the 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 rhetorical point of thinking longer term, I think that's something that every party battles with. Thinking from election to election and trying to balance the need to make long-term decisions versus the immediate emergency of the here and now. As 
as, as you described, the tidal waves coming and going, and, and I understand the, the, the tension that's, uh, that's in part of it. But we've seen these reports, Audit Scotland, October of last year, saying the Scottish Government cannot afford to pay for public services in their current form. Uh, in August uh, of this year, short-term cuts to balance annual budgets without a long-term plan for reform risks storing up even greater problems for our communities. Um, again, this year, Audit, uh, Fraser of Allender, um, simply delaying spending without a decision on whether to cancel it or not would simply pile on problems for the future. The, all of these external and really um, well-informed organisations do not believe that this government is making long-term strategic decisions. They are making short-term advantageous decisions. So should we not be questioning whether this kind of model is effective at all? Because it takes a lot of resource to do the things that we are talking about here. But you do not seem to be he heeding any of these warnings. Well, I think we are, but I think there's two big drivers for um, the short-term decision-making. I think the first is the nature of the funding. So um, we need to get past, and I, I'm actually very hopeful that the UK government might help us in this. We really need to get beyond once and for all uh, the year-to-year the -year, uh, annual uh, budget setting. So our local authorities need it, we need it. If we could get um, a really decent spending review from the UK government, which I think is next spring, that gives us long-term certainty on funding, it's much easier to uh, plan for the longer term. And the second driver it has been the, um, the, the number of, of challenges, short-term challenges that we've been grappling with. So uh, emerging from COVID, which in itself was a, a sort of short-term emergency shock, we've then had the cost of living emergency shock, uh, we've had a number of, of additional pressures um, that are driven by the inflationary environment, that have meant you have to take uh, immediate decisions. So you've got the inputs, which is the funding position, you've got the outputs, which is the demand. And I think if we could get an element of stability, get through this, if we can work, and we are working quite collaboratively with the UK government right now on the longer term point, that starts to set us up to make the, 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 the decisions. The other thing I would just make briefly is that the very difficult choices that Shona Robinson has had to take. And I know um, uh, the member has um, obviously you know, been scrutinising that and holding us all to account for the decisions that have been made. But if we can make some of those really difficult decisions now, it actually sets us up to be able to think about funding for the long term on some of the biggest, most impactful changes that are required to give that uh, that, that longer term stability to others in terms of what actually works. I don't think you would find any disagreement from this committee on, on that point. But as I've already cited, there's a range of external observers who are saying that's exactly what's not happening with this government, uh, given the, the handle of public finances. So you, you did have a go at this, though, Deputy First Minister when you were finance secretary in your resource spending review. Mm -hmm. So you tried to take some decisions um, for, for the long term and to talk about a, a strategy. Um, and Shona Robson came to committee and said that actually she was ditching that policy because it was a blunt tool. Is that not what happens to long term thinking under this government? Uh, no, because um, we, I think, are uh, making uh, those uh, decisions. I think that at the point at which that was uh, published, 2022, and I still stand by it. I know the amount of work that went into producing uh, that spending review, but that was published immediately prior to double digit levels of inflation. It was published just immediately prior to uh, pay deals that mirrored the rocketing cost of living. So I think that good grown-up governments don't just make plans, stick their fingers in their ears and ignore what's happening around them. I think good governments are conscious of what's happening while still sticking to the long-term ambitions of that plan. And I think that what you've seen from Shona Robinson in the last uh, few months in particular, of making difficult choices to set us up for the long term, is actually very much in the spirit of the spending review that I published in spring 22. So, so it wasn't a blunt tool? Um, I think that it, it was a, a really good piece of work. And I think it was um, very conscious of uh, the trade-offs that would have to be made in terms of the long-term finances. And I obviously uh, stood up and multiple committees defended it in evidence.
Okay, uh, one last question, if that's okay, Kambira. The, um, around, it's a slightly different area, though, the, in the point between the difference between the Sustainable Development Goals and a National Performance Framework as a tool to try and drive performance, is this not conceptually a basis upon which we set outcomes and try and measure them against them, whereas the Sustainable Development Goals are calls to action? As described, and that they essentially, when you see them, they have funding pots set against them. They have a positive action that can be about aligning activity. Whereas, what in essence you're doing with this is um, a civil service, as you've described it, but an organising principle. And I find that the confusion between those two operating models for the bureaucracy might actually be part of the problem rather than the solution. So they're not the same things: the sustainable development goals and the national performance framework. Very, very interesting observation. Um, and you're right, there is a distinction between them because the sustainable goals, as it were, is the is 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 what we are trying to support the delivery of. Um, but this is a this is a government document, so it is it is a, it is an organising document. It is something that is trying to embed the northern star of the UN Sustainable Goals in the work that we do and in the work that we want other agencies and actors to do in, in, in Scotland. I also think, though, that that tension you talk about is what makes the reporting so challenging. Because the ultimate reporting, for example, of reducing poverty, is that you reduce poverty. So the ultimate aim of, of, of our, the environment or climate change objectives is that you meet the climate change goals. Um, the, the key is that how do you measure that over time to know that you're on the right track? So we have uh, and we have the reporting on, on the child poverty statistics, for example, which is not a national performance framework uh, statistic. It is the government's statistics. But you can use those to say whether or not the national performance framework is achieving its its aims, and I think I think that's why it's it's perhaps more messy than the committee would like, because it'd be much easier to just measure inputs and outputs quite tightly within the remit of the national performance framework, it, and I, and I think it is just much broader uh, than that. Thanks, Kabir. Thank you, Liz. Um, Deputy First Minister, given that local government is technically responsible for the delivery of a lot of the national performance framework outcomes, to what extent is it easy for the Scottish Government to measure which local authorities are doing really well in the delivery of their own performances? Excellent question. And if any officials want to come in just in terms of the role of local authorities in setting it. Um, it's very similar to... So I, I think it's hard. It's arguably too hard. And, you know, I, I'm, again, committee has ideas on this. I think it's arguably too hard because we, there's a, there is a lot of data that is collated, obviously, on a local basis. And we know where, for example, it, there are higher levels of poverty. And um, that doesn't necessarily monitor, though, the effectiveness of local bodies in tackling that. So we know where the, uh, that the starting point might be too hot, high, but often there's a lot of focus on what national government is doing to tackle it whilst forgetting the role of local authorities. And by its very nature, there's echoes of this question in Michael Mara's question, which is not confusing political manifestos with the national performance framework, because um, in every local authority around the country, there will be different political colours with different views about how to achieve a particular aim. So you may have um, parties, uh, local authority administrations that are more aligned with your party, which have very strong views on how you, for example, achieve economic prosperity. And that is an indirect route to reducing poverty. Whereas others will be more explicit on aims and ambitions directly linked to the child poverty uh, um, ambition. And you know, in a dictatorship, you might be able to just say it's national performance framework. This is how we're going to do things. This is how we're going to do that around the country. That is not our style, nor do I think any of us want to get to that point. So we'll you know, go there, down there the dictatorship route. We can do, route. <laughs> we can do um, in terms of better monitoring locally, uh, but I think it speaks to the messiness inherent in 
in, in, a, in a national document like this, where we're all saying we have a stake in achieving these aims because we all believe in the UN Sustainable Goals. But can I just ask, on that uh, basis, I mean, you mentioned earlier that um, one of the big asks from uh, local authorities and stakeholders is that they try to think out with silos, that you try to have some um, cross... cross um, the, the attempts to get across um, sort of breeding of the outcomes would be very helpful. And I just wonder, are, are there examples, do you think, of local authorities who are able to think out the box and to deliver better outcomes on that national performance framework? And therefore, if there are such local authorities, is that something that the Scottish Government is looking at to, to try to encourage, um, you know, saying you've done very well on this because you've managed to put things together? Yeah. So if I could use one, one example um, here. So the reason I'm in Shetland is because I was at the Convention of the Highlands and Islands yesterday. So as you will know, that is all of our rural coastal island areas. So North Ayrshire up to Shetland, including Murray. And the whole point of that is to essentially learn from one another about how we are achieving goals which directly mirror the national performance uh, framework. So we yesterday, and it's live stream, so anybody can watch it, were sharing case studies. So Shetland was sharing case studies about what it's doing on housing. The Highland Council were sharing case studies and what it's doing with some of the major energy developments and fuel poverty. So that's an example. Now, your question is probably more around, right, how do you quantify that? Give, it, give us some data that proves that. And I think that's where the chief statistician's work comes in as part of the review, working with the Office of National Statistics, which is to say, how can the monitoring of this be more quantifiable than just sharing anecdote and story or waiting for the statistics to be published around child poverty or the statistics that are published every month on economic Performance. You know, we, we have the statistics every month on GD, GDP, on, on, on employability and so on. All of those are statistics, which actually are directly about the national performance framework, but nobody's calling them national performance framework statistics. Um, but can I ask, um, I don't know uh, who wants to come in and hopefully you'll be unmuted really rapidly, either Keith or Katie, maybe unmute them both and one of them can come in. Keith. <laughs> Um, what, 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 one general point, I think, around around local government is, I think, that the, the, the committee's own inquiry, I think, has identified some pockets of, of good practice um, coming through. So the SPICE analysis draws some of that out. So I think good practice on the qualitative side, as the DFM said, is important. And that, again, goes back to our implementation plan ideas, because um, that will need to include how we, how, how we highlight case studies and good practices and so on. Or should include local government. And indeed, our, our National Performance Framework website at the moment does include information like that. So that, that would be important. Um, on the data side, I don't know, Katie, is there anything to add or anything we could furnish the committee with in due course? There we go. That's me unmuted. Thank you. Yeah, so it's just worth me saying and kind of reminding us that the indicator set is not designed to provide a comprehensive view of all available evidence, but to give that indication of progress through some of the key headline measures at that national level. So, as I've mentioned already, it doesn't collect data directly and it utilises data collections and surveys and administration administrative data that are already published. So that data is already published at its aggregated level, we're available. Um, so I guess it's just to say that, um, as has already been mentioned, the Chief Statistician has been really considering with us around how we review and report on the work going forward. And I think ensuring that we're really linking to um, other um, areas of government where they're publishing the statistics. And you know maybe that's not one of our headline measures, but they are breaking it down at a local authority level. I think it's just making sure that we're really making those links and making them really clear. So that's something we'll keep can, um, in consideration with the Chief Statistician. OK, Thanks. thank you. That's helpful. Just my final point uh, to Kate Forbes, if I may. I mean, we discussed earlier that um, in perhaps in the last two or three years, there are some, not everybody, but there are some who feel that the emphasis on the national performance framework has not been as high as it was before, and therefore it's been more difficult to, to meet the 
uh, demands of that national performance framework. Do you think one of the possible reasons for that difficulty is because it's actually a, a very um, ambitious, in theory, um, performance framework that is looking to do some very difficult things, including looking at how you combine uh, very different objectives and the opportunity costs that are involved in all that. Is that perhaps one of the difficulties? Um, and I think Mr Mason mentioned the point that you know we've added on, or you, the Scottish Government's added on, a few extra dimensions to that. Has that made it more difficult, do you think? Um, I mean, I... I... So I don't necessarily share the, the premise, but I'm conscious that stakeholders have uh, expressed their views on that. I was responsible for the National Performance Framework as Finance Secretary a couple of years ago. And I suppose it was really visible then in my world between incomes, in, in, inputs and outcomes. So in a sense, that the, the budget is an area where it's the easiest thing, I think, to build on the basis of the national performance framework. So my economy brief right now is, is a little bit more tricky to directly mirror. Um, but the budget is an easier, just in terms of the mechanics I'm talking about here, uh, the mechanics. The budget is a very inherently mechanical thing. And it's much easier in a world where you want it to uh, link things directly to link the budget to the national performance framework. So I think I found it a lot easier to come to committee, for example, and to directly map inputs and outcomes, you know, money we chose to spend here directly because and there was a huge amount of work in embedding the national performance framework in, in budgets. I think since that period, it goes to what I said to Michael and um, Mara, which is that uh, politics by its nature has to also respond to emerging challenges. And I just think that the last few years have been absolutely um, turbulent in terms of the, the emergencies that have arisen around, around COVID, around um, cost of living, and governments have a duty to respond to that. So perhaps if there's any way in which I see um, in, a, in, a, in a stable environment, you have the luxury of being able to directly link national performance framework to, uh, to, to, the, out, to, the, to the inputs. In a world where, let's take poverty, poverty looks like it's about to increase because inflation is increasing and the amount of money you have available to you has reduced because inflation has eroded it. You have a very different set of choices to make than if everything else remains equal. And I think it is, I think it, I, I think by its nature, it, all of us would like things to remain stable and to be able to track inputs and outcomes very simply and straightforwardly. But that's not the world that we that we live in. And who knows, maybe, maybe the next few years are going to be a, a, a period of stability, prosperity, happiness for all, uh, and uh, these things are easier to track. Thank you. Oh, what a wonderful world that would be. <laughs> yeah. Motherhood and apple pie all round. Um, just uh, one or two more questions from me just to finish off, really. I mean, I think it's quite clear that what we need is a, a focus on clear and measurable milestones to identify tangible um, improvements. Uh, but in, in our 2022 report, we noted that uh, five years after the previous review, a number of NPF indicators had no data. So what guarantees do we have this time that all indicators will provide data so that we can measure progress from the start? So th this goes to, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Katie that mentioned um, we don't uh, we don't basically um, collect our own data, we use data. So I think that's a whole government responsibility to understand where we don't have data on anything that we do, because ultimately every penny that we spend should have a demonstrable benefit to the people who raised the revenue in the first place to, to, to reinvest, in other words, taxpayers. So there needs to be uh, that uh, data. So I, I am open to understanding and to feeding back to the chief statistician if and where there are any gaps in terms of the data and the indicators.
I have to say that when the Scottish Fiscal Commission gave evidence to us last month, they suggested 21 separate areas for improvement in data collection in order just for them to do their work more effectively. So I think data is an issue, which in fact this committee has been talking about for a good decade or so. So the more uh, I realise not being a devolved administration, you don't have the same access, for example, that the UK necessarily uh, would have, but I still think it's an area where we have to have significant improvements on. I just want to, to ask the you, Deputy First Minister, if, um, as we wind up, if there's any further points that you want to make um, following our questioning that perhaps you feel we haven't touched on, if there's a burning issue you want to get over in relation to the National Performance Framework and how we go forward. So it was only to repeat, so not new, my openness to the committee's report and to accept that the national performance framework cannot be only owned by government. It has to be seen as something broader than that. So parliament, committees, other parties ha all have a stake in feeding in the work that, to, to the work that we do. And implementation is going to be the key here. We'll have lots of dispute, perhaps debate, discussion on what the substance of the national performance framework should be. But I don't think there's a huge amount of disagreement. So implementation, monitoring, accountability, data, they're going to be the key. Uh, and I'm very open to the committee's views on how we do that more effectively without ever forgetting that actually data doesn't impact on an outcome. It will be the policies that impact on an outcome, but the data allows you to, to, to review it. So Ultimately, eh, our focus needs to be squarely on meeting the outcomes, eh, but we recognise the importance of, of monitoring in that process. OK, and I thank the Deputy First Minister and officials for attending today from Shetland. It's not as beautiful as Anna and my own constituency, but it certainly seems a lot easier to get to. Um, can I ask... Uh, um, can I just say that uh, we will continue our, um, na let's conclude our um, outcome scrutiny, but we'll report on our views and recommendations to the Scottish Government in November. And just before we wind up, can I ask those committee members who are able to do so to stay behind for an informal discussion with the University of Dundee students and staff about our work and answer any questions about the session they observed today with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, and thank you, to, uh, Deputy First Minister. I now close the meeting. <laughs>